Hello guys, welcome back to my channel The Fanfic Fantasy. Join us as we explore the world of fanfiction and fantasy and bring you the best story and discussions. This is the 8th part of What if Tanjiro time traveled and became a demon? So give this video a like and subscribe for more videos in future. So let's get into the fanfic. The Yubayashiki estate was, in a word, strange. Tenjiro hadn't been used to being in, or even seeing, estates when he'd lived on his mountain with his family. Oh, sure, they'd had a couple nearby but they were few and far between. The rare time Tenjiro had seen one, though, they'd always looked pristine on the outside, and from what little he could see on the inside when the doors were open. Once he'd left to begin his training, though, he'd seen several estates, in various states of repair, but the Yubayashiki estate topped them all. It almost looked abandoned on the outside, with cracks in the walls and ivy growing everywhere, spiderwebs left completely alone and bird or insect nests in whatever nooks and crannies they could find. The paint on the walls had begun to peel and the tops of anything visible from the outside had chipped. The doors even looked crooked, like they'd fall over at any given moment. Inside, though, well, while he couldn't call it pristine, it still contrasted greatly with the outside. It was clean and well-tended, with maybe the exception of some parts of the landscape. He walked through well-swept halls as he looked for his target, and couldn't help but marvel at how many people the Demon Slayer core head would have to employ to keep both the inside and the outside in the states they were in. He suspected the Kakashi had a lot to do with that. They had to do something while they weren't cleaning up after demon attacks, after all. It took him longer to find Sanmi than he thought it would. First, he checked the cellar, but only found a sleeping Kamiko there. After that, he began to check the various rooms and the two dojos on his way outside. That was where he finally found Sanmi training with his wind style, trying to incorporate his demon blood art into the forms. He stalked around a dummy set up in the middle of the training grounds, slowly moving and concentrating on his footwork without taking his eyes off of the target. Tanjiro paused as he watched the man break his total concentration breathing to take a deep breath, then blew out with a flick of that long, purple tongue. Then he fell right back into the rhythm of wind breathing as he made his regular attack. He didn't call it out, so Tanjiro didn't know exactly which form he used, but the force hit the target within moments of each other. The double hit tore the dummy apart. Literally, it would take meticulous timing and battle to use the attacks well, but if anyone could do it, Tanjiro would put his money on Sanmi using it to devastating effect. He wondered why the demon's blood art had developed into more or less typhoon breaths. Certainly wind-based, but why that form specifically? Especially as he had no idea if he'd influenced Sanmi's demon form at all, let alone his blood art. He still had no idea what determined that, but was positive that a turned breath user's style influenced the form a blood art took. Sanmi paused in his movements, observing his handiwork for several seconds, probably dissecting everything he'd just done and looking for ways to improve or modify the attack. Tanjiro smiled at his dedication, just allowing himself to admire the man for several seconds. Then he straightened his back and rushed forward. Sanmi San. The wind pillar turned to scowl at Tanjiro. Because of course he did. It was Shinazugawa Sanmi. What do you want? He asked, a little sullenly, even for Sanmi. Tanjiro refused to let the man's attitude faze him. This was nothing compared to the torture of traveling with him constantly cutting himself to tempt Tanjiro with his Marechi blood. I just wanted to let you know that I'm heading to the swordsmith village to train with Haimjima-san and prepare for the demon attack that I remember happening. Sanmi frowned. Demon attack. Tanjiro nodded. With two waxing moons, the wind pillar's eyes narrowed for a moment, and then he nodded. We've been assigned to go. The younger demon blinked. Oh, um, no. Well, I have. But you haven't? Tanjiro rushed to reassure the man. Would you like to go? Or stay here? The taller man blinked rapidly, then frowned again. I can't stay, not without you to keep me from. Going off, Tanjiro thought about that for a moment. Before you decide, I'd like to point out that Oyakata-sama is letting Hashira stay around him right now, something he hasn't ever done before. Also, Aguro-san is coming by in a couple of days. I know you'd like to protect Oyakata-sama, so do you think you can hold out that long? I'd feel better knowing more people were here to keep the Yubai Ashiki family safe. And yes, I trust you. For just a second he looked more vulnerable than Tanjiro had ever seen before. Why? The time traveler just smiled. Because you still want to protect people more than anything, even if it's from yourself. Sami looked torn for a moment. After a couple of seconds, he frowned warily. Is the third Kazuki staying? 
The time traveler rolled his eyes, probably a little more fondly than he wanted it to be. Former Kazuki and yes, the other man did not look happy. He sat there for several seconds, obviously weighing his choices back and forth before seeming to come to a decision with a firm nod. Fine, I'll stay. That actually surprised the smaller demon a bit. He had been prepared to give in to whatever Sami pushed for, and giving in that easily was. Well, the man didn't often change his mind. You will, yeah. Tanjiro couldn't help but smile softly. Okay. The white-haired man relaxed a little, before tensing up and looking down worriedly. Tanjiro could guess where his thoughts had gone, so he shrugged. You made a good decision, Sanmi. And I meant it when I said I trust you. Now you just have to trust yourself. Sanmi blinked. How? How can you trust me like that? Because I know you. Tanjiro grinned widely as the wind pillar just stared at him and said nothing. Eventually, it got awkward and Tanjiro began looking for a reason to leave. Before he could say anything, though, another voice rang through the clearing. Oi, there you are. I, ho, you're here too. Akatsugi had focused on Tanjiro before turning his attention to Sanmi. Great, let's fight. Tanjiro sighed. You sound like Inosuke. The pink-haired demon blinked, then frowned. Who? Oh, right. He hadn't met Inosuke this time around and Tanjiro didn't really want to explain it. Never mind. He replied, waving his hand dismissively. Then he peered at Sanmi out of the corner of his eye. He looked about ready to explode. Weren't we going to train some more? He asked the newcomer hurriedly, hoping to stop a fight between the two of them. Sure. When I win this fight, Akatsugi replied, not taking his eyes off of Sanmi and grinning ruefully. Bring it, demon, Sanmi hissed. Tenjiro sighed, realizing he couldn't prevent this. Um, they both turned their glares on him, one pair of slitted eyes, one set of kanji. Tenjiro sighed. Don't destroy the compound. Fine, I know a place nearby where we can go all out. Akatsugi said, never dropping that sharp grin as he turned to look back at the man he'd challenged. Before Sanmi could interrupt and say something stupid, like he wouldn't follow a demon anywhere or something like that, Tenjiro nodded hurriedly. Great, lead the way. The wind pillar opened his mouth to object, but then closed it and growled deeply. Akatsugi ignored that and jumped out of the compound, laughing. I'm coming too, Tenjiro called after him, then raised an eyebrow at Sanmi. Fine. The white-haired man grumbled through gritted teeth before jumping to follow the other demon. Tenjiro shook his head at the wind pillar. Then he glanced over his shoulder at the estate, wondering if he should tell someone. But he didn't want to take the chance that those two would kill each other before he arrived if he took the time to do so. And they could, too. Akatsugi had his Nikairin knives, and Sanmi the traditional blade. He decided he'd apologize later if it was a problem. Right now, stopping those two from rearranging the countryside sounded like a much better idea. He could slow both of them down if he had to, and he could only hope that would be enough. So he leapt into the air and out of the compound. XXX. The two of them went all out. It took Tenjiro running around and countering some of the strikes with his own forms to contain it somewhat, and even then too much got past him. The grass-covered clearing soon became a much wider, very barren clearing and Tanjiro had to stop each of them from completely obliterating the other no less than five times. Three from Akatsugi, twice from Sanmi. Finally, Tanjiro had enough and called for them to stop. Thankfully, both of them did, dropping to the ground across from and glaring at each other over Tanjiro's head. After a couple of seconds, though, Akatsugi broke into a huge grin. Now that was a fight, and you're so used to your blood arts and demon abilities already. You pillars are something else. Sanmi growled and looked about ready to attack again. But Tanjiro frowned in question. Demon abilities. Other than his blood art. The other demon blinked. Well, yeah. I mean, enhanced body and senses. His reactions are top notch. And it's obvious he can hear what high level demons can. I'm surprised it's so good this soon after being turned. Although it still takes several seconds for him to regrow limbs. But it's still surprising. And you think that's because he was a pillar as a human. What else would it be? Tanjiro opened his mouth to reply, but Sanmi beat him to it. Stop talking about me. I'm right freaking here. The time traveler winced and turned apologetically to his white-haired subordinate. Then he bowed. Apologies, Sanmi Sam. Yeah, me too, Akatsugi said nonchalantly. Probably didn't even bow, but he also said it on his own, so Tanjiro would take it. Whether Sanmi would or not, I'm out. And you better watch yourself, demon, the wind pillar shot, pointing a finger angrily at Akatsugi who looked amused if anything. Same. Tanjiro withheld a sigh but couldn't stop himself from rolling his eyes as Sanmi practically stomped away. He stood up to me. And I'm positive I could beat Dauma right now, Akatsugi said quietly. Dunno if I could kill him, but I can beat him. They continued to watch the wind pillar leave until he disappeared into the tree line. He's still not strong enough to fight Kokushibo alone, Tanjiro muttered darkly. 
Akatsugi snorted. Yeah, no, and Musen's even stronger. A heavy silence fell over them before Akatsugi finally broke it. Yeah, Tanjiro deliberately avoided checking what both Akatsugi and Sanmi were feeling, choosing instead to examine his own thoughts and memories regarding both the strongest waxing moon and the demon progenitor. After a couple of minutes, he sighed and turned to his subordinate. We should probably get back before we're missed. I obviously still need to train. Obviously, Akatsugi snorted. Let's go then. With a nod, he and Tenjiro leapt after the white-haired demon. XXX. Sanmi hated this. He hated being a demon. He hated talking and interacting with demons. He hated everything about demons. And yet the human-eating former Kazuki had the gall to compliment him. On his technique, he hated it all. He hated the fact that he wouldn't have stopped fighting if Kamado hadn't been there to stop him. Looking back, Sanmi was a little surprised he'd had the presence of mind to actually make battle-worthy decisions. All he'd wanted towards the end was to tear the other demon apart, more so than normal. He'd been less angry and more primal, aggressive, demonic. How long would he have been in that state of mind, with that level of energy? He didn't know. Indefinitely, or only minutes, who would get hurt if the former was true. He hated this. Ah, Shinazugawa-san. A sunny voice broke him out of his thoughts and he glanced over to see Rengoku rise from a kneeling position on the Ingawa. Sanmi blinked. When had he gotten here again? Where had he even been going? Had he been that lost in thought? His self-discipline really was shot. HM, he grunted with a nod at the yellow-haired man. Is Kamado-san with you? The question took Sanmi by surprise, but also served to remind him of the whole situation that he hated so much all over again and he grit his teeth. Then he sensed for the other two demons. They were still outside the compound but coming towards them. They're that way, he said, practically growled, really. They should be here soon. They were heading in the two pillars direction, which probably meant they were coming for training, which meant that Sanmi would have to either find somewhere else to train or give up on the idea of training altogether, which just ticked him off more. He went to stalk angrily past Rengoku, but the man stood quickly, sword in hand, and fell into step beside him. That surprised Sanmi. You just asked about them. Don't you gotta talk to them or something? Rengoku's smile slipped a little, but it may as well have been a frown with his normal disposition. No, I think I would rather avoid Kamado-san right now. Sanmi raised an eyebrow in curiosity. What had the kid done, he wondered. Rengoku noticed his expression and his eyes widened a bit in realization. Not through any fault of his own, of course. The demon frowned. Then why? The flame pillar fell quiet before answering. I just received news of my father's death. He died defending Kamado's sister. From waxing one, I simply wish to avoid the reminder until I have better control over myself. And then the man's smile returned, although it looked more forced than normal. It honestly freaked Sanmi out a little. He figured he should probably say something. Sorry, about your dad and all. He knew what it was like to lose a parent due to demons. The smile seemed to melt into something more real, more normal. Thank you, Shinazugawa-san. You enrich the core with your presence. And he meant it. That took Sanmi back and he stopped, just staring at the yellow and red-haired man, who took a couple of seconds to realize he was walking alone. He also paused and turned to face the wind pillar, questioning. How can you say that? Sanmi asked, his hands shaking at his sides he clenched his fists so hard. Rengoku tipped his head to one side, that dumb smile still in place. Why wouldn't I? I merely speak the truth. I'm a demon. Yet you control your urges. It is truly a mark of strength. No it isn't. Sanmi shouted, breathing heavily. Rengoku looked surprised enough to clamp his mouth shut, blinking at his fellow pillar. Then he just sort of deflated. Sometimes, sometimes I can't control it. He looked down at his hands, claws so obvious. And yet you haven't killed a human, the flame pillar said, his voice surprisingly gentle. Only cause I was lucky, Sami grumbled. Had people round who could stop me. People you purposefully sought out. Well, he wasn't wrong. I do not care that you have become a demon. I trust you, Shinazugawa-san, because you deserve it. You have made the most out of a very poor hand and are turning a weakness into a strength. Sanmi hadn't expected that. He felt a little embarrassed, actually, and looked down, scuffing the Ingawa with his foot. I've been lucky, he insisted. And one day that luck will run out. One day, he'd lose it and a human would be in his way and... And that would be the end of it. Rengoku seemed to think about that for a moment before he finally answered. If that day comes, I and every other Hashira will be there to stop you. His smile widened again. But that day is not today. Come, the flame pillar said with a smile as he slapped a hand fondly on Sanmi's shoulder. Demons can drink tea. Let us share a pot. Sanmi had never really liked most teas but... That sounded good right now. Yeah, he agreed and followed the other man inside. 
It was only later that he remembered Rengoku had been grieving his father, and yet, even in his pain, he'd taken the time to reassure Sanmi. His respect for the flame pillar shot up that day. XXX, so, you're leaving then? Akatsugi asked as he handed one of Tenjiro's fingers back to him. Long since used to the morbidity of it all, he closed his eyes and concentrated. It took several seconds, but the small appendage disappeared and the time traveler nodded firmly both at the question and at the accomplishment. He'd gotten much faster. Yeah, probably as soon as I'm done here. He held his hand out for another finger, trying not to look at it while concentrating on it at the same time. Reabsorption was still inhuman and about as gross as anything he'd ever seen. Willing his flesh to move and change was also a strange feeling, one that sent shivers up and down his spine every time. But he was getting it, and it could be useful. He shook his head and continued to explain. I just spoke with Oyakata-sama about it, actually. So that's why you went inside after we got back. Akatsugi asked, glancing over at the house before looking back at the demon progenitor. Yeah, what about the brat in the basement? The pink-haired demon asked, handing the small appendage over. Tenjiro paused. Right, Kimiko, could you keep an eye on her? Just make sure she doesn't wake up and stop her from attacking people if she does. The former waxing third didn't answer for several seconds. Then he frowned. You want me to protect the weak? The time traveler blinked, then shook his head. Hadn't they already talked about this? He was positive they had, so he looked back up and met the other's gaze again, trying to convey his disappointment without actually speaking it aloud. It must have worked because Akatsugi flinched and looked away, then cleared his throat. Habit, it would probably be better to get someone dedicated to her to watch over her. So he shook his head. If you don't want to, I can ask Rengoku-san to. No, no, I'll do it. He sounded pained, but determined. Tanjiro watched him for several seconds and took another finger to absorb. You sure? Akatsugi hesitated again. But when he did answer, he nodded firmly. Yeah. Tanjiro grinned, proud of the guy. He didn't think he could tell him that, he probably wouldn't take it well. But, a shock went through his body from his hand where he had just reabsorbed his finger. He jumped a little, staring at his palm. That, hadn't happened before. What, had that been? Akatsugi was staring at him now with a strange expression on his face. Tanjiro frowned and cautiously tapped into what he could sense from the demon. Wariness and, anticipation. What was that? He asked slowly. When the pink-haired man didn't respond, Tenjiro felt his eyes narrow. I know you know something. His expression fell into resignation. That was my finger. Tenjiro blinked at him, then looked back down at his palm, brows furrowed, and then up again. What? Musen would absorb demons to get their powers, he said with a shrug. The time traveler did not like where this was going. It's how he plans on conquering the sun. Right, Tenjiro said slowly, holding his hand against him as if it had been hurt, as if he needed to protect it, as silly as that was. Was curious to see if you could gain our powers. Figured we can start small and go up if not. The demon progenitor just blinked at his subordinate. You, want me to, absorb you? He asked, feeling more than a little sick. Akatsugi shrugged. Musen stole our powers, but I don't think he ever cared enough to try and see if he could just gain the powers without completely absorbing the demon too. Tenjiro stood then, glaring down defensively. Why? He didn't want to be like Musen. And, Akatsugi knew that but had taken his choice away anyway. Hadn't even talked to him about it, just shoved him into. What? An experiment. Why did it feel like when he'd become a demon to begin with? Why didn't you say something? He asked, unable to keep the betrayal from his voice. Because you wouldn't have agreed to it and you need every bit of strength you can get. He wasn't wrong. But still, maybe in the first couple of timelines he would have blindly gone along with it. Or if not, he would have explained why he didn't like what had happened and then just moved on but. He wasn't the boy from the first timeline anymore. He hadn't been for a long time, no matter how much he acted like it. At that moment, it took every ounce of strength he had to not lash out and completely take Akatsugi apart until he stopped regenerating. And that scared him. You should have asked, was all he said, all he could bring himself to say, before turning and hurrying away. See if you can use shockwaves at some point, the former waxing third called after him. He didn't answer. He couldn't. Were those tears coming to his eyes? He blinked several times and his vision cleared. For now, he didn't understand why this made him so upset, except that he felt like a demon now, like a waxing moon instead of a human demon slayer. Normally, with the exception of the hunger, he still felt like he could at least present himself as, well, himself, as Kamado Tanjiro and not waxing zero. But every now and then it would just hit him. He would never be Kamado Tanjiro again, no matter how much he pretended. He needed to get away before he did something he regretted later before he reacted like he had forced himself to in the previous two loops with Musen. 
hovering over his shoulder and encouraging or outright ordering the most heinous. He shook his head. He didn't want that to become a habit again. Never again. That was fine. He had to leave anyway. As he rushed into the estate, he couldn't help but reach out and see what Akatsugi was feeling. He found concern and guilt. That, well, that was good at least. Right. It didn't help what he'd done, but maybe they could talk later, after Tanjiro had come back from the swordsmith village. What really got to him, though, was the resignation and fear. Akatsugi was still scared of him. Still expected him to, well, do what Musen would have done and destroy him or at least discipline him. Painfully, and not like him, he whispered to himself, clutching his hands to his chest tightly. And not. He was fine. He was fine. XXX. Nezuko took a deep breath and went into the stance for her final form. Ninth form, Sapwood Flow. And with that, she moved across the clearing, concentrating on her feet, and then her swings as she twirled through the air, adding just that much extra power to the arc of each swing. Timing was crucial here. It wasn't perfect, not by any means, especially as she'd only just come up with the technique and she hadn't had nearly enough time to practice it. Still, it would work in a fight and it would showcase her goal for this form of her style. Reaching the arc of the form, she sliced through the tree she'd been aiming for and then made sure to get out of the way as it began to fall. They needed the wood to finish the last cart they would need for completing the move from their mountain home anyway. The tree fell to the forest floor with a mighty crash, sending poofs of leaves, dust and seeds into the air. Nezuko stayed in the final stance, breathing hard, for several seconds before standing up and facing her teacher. Yurikodaki stood across the clearing, arms folded and one hand stroking the chin of his mask. I see, he finally said thoughtfully. You created this style to make up for the lack of strength that would have otherwise been a detriment. Nezuko smiled widely. Hi, sensei. The masked man nodded. Why not circumvent the problem as our insect pillar has? The eldest Kamado girl sheathed her sword and began to make her way towards her sensei. Shinobu-san is an amazing pillar, but she admits that her form has problems. I'm not extremely skilled in poison and don't want to be dependent on her expertise. I wanted a form I created and that I can change and tweak as needed, one that I not only know inside and out, but one that is made for me. The nod her teacher gave her that time was both firm and heavy with approval. As soon as she got within range of his arm, he reached over and patted her head. You have indeed grown well, child. I am most impressed with your forms. You are fast approaching the level of a Hashira and have exceeded my expectations. She couldn't help but beam at him as the warmth of his compliment filled her. Thank you, Sensei. And even now that you have the strength and ability to wield the water form to its fullest extent, you would still use your unrefined form. Nezuko deflated a little. Well, I don't see a problem using the form to enhance my strength further. And my speed. It may not be necessary now like it used to be, but demons can still reach levels even the masters of forms can't reach. Maybe this is a way to push it and level the playing field that much more. You still need to work on your timing in that final form of yours. She'd been expecting that. Yes, sensei. I know. A pause. Then the older man ventured. Before we begin to cut branches from the tree you felled, I could. Give you some pointers on where to enhance your swings to gain the maximum strength. Nezuko blinked and then grinned happily, bouncing a little excitedly. Would you, sensei? I would love to know what you think would help. She didn't see his face, obviously, but she could practically feel the soft smile that crossed his lips. He patted her shoulder this time instead of her head. Then let us begin. Show me the stance of your ninth form again. Nezuko did so, withdrawing her sword. Yurikodaki sensei nodded. Now, slowly, show me the next steps. XXX. Will you hurry up, Tenitsu? Inasuke yelled over his shoulder at a wheezing Zenitsu. That's not my name. The lightning breather yelled back angrily, then fell into a wheeze again. I want to go fight the demon. Zenitsu felt his heart stop at his companion's words. Fight the demon. The former waxing moon they were supposed to be training with. Why was he doing this again? A waxing moon, former or not, would slaughter them. His knees felt weak and he collapsed, unable to withhold a whimper. The demon was supposed to be good now and supposed to help train them but he was a waxing moon. Did no one else see a problem with this? Don't just sit there and cry like a baby again. Inasuke yelled, arms in the air as he stomped on the ground like a child. Zenitsu could almost see his breath shooting out of his mask, even though it wasn't nearly cold enough for that. I don't want to go. The yellow-haired boy cried, shaking his head back and forth frantically. It's too Skyari, so you're gonna break your promise to Mizuko. That brought Zenitsu up short because, right, he'd promised the now absent Mizuko he'd train as hard as he could. But did that really mean he had to fight a demon? Why did it have to mean that? He was just about to open his mouth and say just that, but Inasuke beat him to it. Fine, you stay here and cry. 
I'll go and meet Nazaki and I'll be super strong and she'll be able to see how amazing I am. Wait, did that mean, was Inosuke, in love with Nezuko? Was he going to try and take Nezuko away from him? Oh no, no, Zenitsu surged to his feet, a newfound energy he didn't have before rushing through him. Before he could say anything, though, the boar went racing off over the next hill. Oh, he couldn't let Inosuke get there first. Couldn't let him sh moose his way up to Nezuko. He could see it right now. Nezuko blushing so cutely as Inosuke called her by the wrong name and him flexing, and her saying he was so good looking. And, not, happening. Lightning breath first form, thunderclap flash godspeed. He hissed, pushing himself to the absolute limits. He would not let Boarhead beat him out, demon or not. And he screamed as he shot past Inosuke. Wait, why was he only hearing the boar cackling behind him? XXX. Musen slammed the latest book he'd been looking through closed and tossed it aside, not caring that it went through several walls. The growth Japan had seen recently was unprecedented. There were more humans, sources of food and fun playthings, and more knowledge available than ever before, and yet he still couldn't find anything to do with the blue spider lilies. Why? Once he'd realized that society was changing in a way it never could have begun to before, he'd allowed himself to hope again. But like every other time, it had proven in vain. Why? Why was it so hard to find a couple of simple flowers? Had they truly gone extinct? His only other option was to keep turning humans into demons in the hopes that one of them would be able to conquer the sun and he would be able to absorb them and be done with it. He could finally make his move on conquering the entire world, subjugating every sapient being on the planet. The very idea made his multiple hearts writhe with pleasure, but he couldn't count on that just yet. He had to first conquer the sun. Fortunately, he had recently created an idea as to how to do it. There was something different about the sun breathers. The boy had turned into a demon without ever having met or seen Musen. He had marked eyes, and there was a story there that the demon king couldn't truly guess at. Some connection to his demons. A demon the boy had come across that had somehow infected his wounds and even that small amount had turned him instead of killing him. Had Musen missed some blood art out there that would turn a human into a demon slowly. Whatever the cause, though, the boy was too dangerous to let live. The girl too. She had resisted being turned twice, but that was due to her brother's blood art. He was sure of it. She had proven to be more trouble than she was worth, so she had to die. However, that left several more children to exploit. He wanted one of those children. As good as they seemed to be at avoiding his demons, even his waxing moons, they could not run forever. He would make sure of it. He continued to contemplate what he would do when he finally caught one of the family brainstorming and discarding several ideas before a door suddenly appeared in front of him. Frowning, he wondered why Nakaim had interrupted him. She knew better. Unless, what is it? He snapped. The door opened to reveal the woman kneeling, Biwa in hand and her single eye fixed on Musen. Musen Sama, she said respectfully. Then she spoke the words that would make his entire day, no, his entire year. I found them. Musen felt a smile creep over his lips. Which ones? He could swear he saw her own lips twitch up in pleasure. All of them. He didn't bother resisting the grin after that. Excellent. Akatsugi approached the gate to the Yubayashiki household, almost shaking in trepidation. Fortunately, when he got there, the area stood empty. The morning sun had begun to lighten the horizon and he marveled for a minute, as he found himself doing so often lately, that he wouldn't have to hide from that light. It was mind-boggling. He'd been waiting for about five minutes when the door to the estate opened and a white-haired child dressed in a rich kimono showed Kamado Tanjiro out of the house. Thanks, Hinaki-san, the boy said happily. It looks like I'll be off. May you have safe travels, the girl said, a little mechanically. Akatsugi still found them a little creepy. Ironically, Tanjiro faded off as he met Akatsugi's eyes. The older demon wasn't fooled. Tanjiro had known he was there. The girl, Hinaki apparently, bowed to both of them, then waited just inside the threshold for several seconds before Tanjiro stepped out of the doorway. Either noticing the tension between the two demons or simply following instructions, she eventually slid the door closed, leaving the two of them alone in an awkward, uncomfortable silence. The former waxing third had never seen Kamado Tanjiro look so blank. It was obviously a mask, but he couldn't figure out if that mask hid panic or worry or a cold anger. At least with Musen, it hadn't been that difficult to tell. On the boy, the blankness was unsettling, and far worse than any look the current demon king had ever given him. Tanjiro continued to stare coolly at Akatsugi, who hated that he looked uncertain. For several seconds, neither of them said anything as the former waxing third didn't know where to start. Finally, Tanjiro sighed and walked right past him, eyes on the road ahead. 
Yeah, he couldn't let that go. It was, after all, why he was here. Wait, Akatsugi said. What? The younger demon asked shortly, turning to look over his shoulder with narrowed eyes. This wasn't Kamado Tanjiro the demon slayer he was dealing with. Akatsugi suddenly realized. No, this was waxing zero. Oh, he consciously had to stop himself from swallowing and opened his mouth instead. You know why I did it? Right. That was not the right thing to say, apparently, as the boy's expression cooled even more. Akatsugi tensed, his instinct screaming at him to be very careful. Because you didn't trust me. Wait, what? You didn't talk to me about your suspicions or theories. The kid shook his head. Look, Akatsugi, I can't make you trust me. That's all up to you. But when you start pulling stunts like that, when you decide to stop giving me a choice despite me doing everything I can to give you one I just... He took a deep breath and looked away. Oh, he hadn't thought of it like that. It had been an idea for more power. And who would turn that down? Certainly not Musen. But this wasn't Musen. Had he somehow forgotten that? Again, Tanjiro met Akatsuga's gaze again. Musen tricked you. He blackmailed me and held my family hostage. He never gave me a choice whenever he could help it. He took pleasure in it. I just didn't expect it from you. The boy's shoulders slumped and he rubbed the back of his head tiredly. But I guess that's more on me than you. Wait, that was not what Akatsugi wanted the kid to get out of this. Which meant there was only one route to take. He swore silently. He hated this route. No, you should be able to trust me. I took advantage of that for my own end so. He grit his teeth. I'm sorry. He looked down, hating how his face flushed. Tanjiro just blinked at him, expression having gone truly blank, no mask in sight. You, what? I'm sorry, all right. I, I'll talk to you, if I get another idea like that. More silence that Akatsugi had to fill. I won't act without your say-so. The boy continued to stare, but eventually spoke cautiously. You, promise, why did his voice sound so small? It was at that moment that Akatsugi realized this kid was just that, a kid. He may have lived 100 lives or whatever, but he was stuck with the mind and body of a teenager. It was a sobering realization. Yeah, I promise. And, for the first time that conversation, Akatsugi saw the old Tenjiro as he smiled so widely it almost hurt to look at. Thank you, Akatsugi-san. I forgive you. Just like that. This kid, train hard while I'm gone. Get your breath style down. I can't wait to see what you do with it. His breath style, well, Rengoku's breath style, fire and wind were supposed to go together, right? So why was he having such a difficult time applying his demon art to it? He had no doubt it could be very powerful if he could figure out how to get the two to work together. Maybe he'd have to try the wind style of breathing, though. But that was if he ran into a dead end. He hadn't given up Rengoku's route just yet, right? He said, a little reserved, wondering how the kid had turned everything around so quickly. Again, then he grinned. Good luck figuring out your training. He very carefully didn't mention anything about shockwaves or air punches. The kid would approach that if he had to. Akatsugi just had to believe that for now. Keep practicing changing your shape and regrowing and reabsorbing. The kid's smile faded a little, but he nodded firmly. I will. Keep people safe. The former waxing third nodded solemnly. Then I'm off, Tenjiro said with a smile as he turned and began to walk away. Why he didn't just start running or leaping. Akatsugi didn't know, but it was what it was, he supposed. Yeah, get there safe, he said and was a little surprised to see how much he meant that. Of course, Tenjiro said. Because of course he did. Akatsugi watched the kid's figure grow smaller and smaller until he disappeared around a bend in the road. Then, shaking his head, the demon turned to go find the training field. Again, he had promises to keep after all. XXX. Obanai frowned as he finished with his investigation of the strange happenings in the town he'd been assigned. Yet another dead end. He'd come across a lot of those, recently. They weren't demon-related, but usually caused by some human problem. This one was most certainly a human crime ring, probably revolving around gambling, that had gotten too out of hand. He suspected use of drugs and kidnapping to explain the missing humans as well. But now he had a choice. He could hunt those kidnapped people down with the intent to free them, or he could return to get another mission that might be demon-based. In the end, the idea of a child being left in captivity as he'd been drove him to begin his search for their head base. At the very least, he could drop the information off at the local police station. And if he freed a couple of kidnappees along the way, well, no one really had to know. Five hours later, the sun had set, he'd dropped the information off, returned a couple of prisoners to their homes and was feeling fairly good about what he'd accomplished when his Kasugai crow, Yuan, descended with some notes in his beak. The crow didn't speak at all as he waited for Obanai to read the missive. As he did so, his face began to turn red. 
Kaburamaru hissed in curiosity at the change of temperature in his human. But Obanai couldn't answer. He didn't even trust himself to open his mouth for fear of what would come out. Dear Obanai-san, the following is an invitation for you and Mitsuri-san to meet at the Akuboko restaurant, near where you are stationed currently. I've given you the address and the map on the back of this paper. If you take me up on this offer, I have already paid for your meal. You just need to show up tomorrow for supper. If you wish to pursue her after that, I'm sure she could help you arrange it, and she would also be thrilled. Just, please take care of her. Good luck, if you decide to send this. Kamado Tenjiro. He eyed the second paper, a little scroll tied up with a ribbon. In a bow. This, this wasn't right. Shouldn't he be talking to her family to set up an omiai? Or, or, um, well, that seemed like an extreme measure to jump to immediately but, but still, and marrying Kunroji. His face darkened even further. He didn't know whether he wanted to sing the demon Hashira's praises or kill him slowly for this. Master, Kaburamaru hissed. Well, it was a hiss that meant more or less the same thing. But still, he flipped the paper over and found the map Kamado had drawn. At the bottom, he found another note. You can do it. You're awesome, Obanai-san. He stared at the note for several seconds. The sun pillar thought he was awesome. His face grew hotter and he felt a little dizzy. Master, Kaburamaru asked again, brushing his cool scales against Obanai's cheek. It helped, focusing back on his constant concentration breathing. The serpent pillar reached up and patted his snake's head. I'm fine, he muttered. Kaburamaru should be able to understand the tone, if not the words. Then he looked down at the rolled invitation, then back at the map. That happened a couple more times before he took a deep breath, straightened to his full height and then turned to his crow. D deliver this to Kenroji-san. Ka, yes sir, Yuan said. Was it just Obanai, or did said crow sound smug? No, he would not blush again. And, and he'd, wait, what was he supposed to do now? Should he get her a present, or would that be too forward? And what kind of present should he buy? Something expensive, or something small? Should he head over there now? It was a town or two away. He could stay there for the night. But, should he ask someone about these things? He thought about all the other people in his life, and only the Hashira seemed remotely close enough to even consider asking such personal questions to. Kenroji and Kamado were out of the question. He couldn't ask either one of them, he felt, for obvious reasons. He didn't know Tomioka, the new kid was just that, a kid who probably had no experience. And he doubted going to a Buddhist monk was a wise idea here. Shinobu and Shinazugawa were harder nosed than the rest of them, as Shinazugawa was still having demon issues and Shinobu wouldn't let anyone who came to her live it down. Ever, that left Yuzui, because he was already married and Rengoku because he knew Kenroji. And to be honest, Obanai wasn't close enough with either of them to feel remotely comfortable writing to them. No, he needed to calm down. This was, this was just him meeting with a co-worker. That was all. Yes, that was all. But he could grab some flowers once he got to the right town anyway. Right? With a nod he hoped was firmer than he felt, he began to make his way towards his next meeting. Realizing he would have to completely rethink everything he'd concluded about one Kamado Tanjiro on the way. XXX. Kenjiro decided that tying a blindfold around his eyes before he got to the swordsmith village would probably go a long way in preventing panic from erupting, even if they knew he was coming. A waxing moon, former or not, just appearing in their village would probably not be received well initially, and they did know he was coming. He'd made doubly sure of it, but still, so he decided to go with that idea, though not before poking holes in said blindfold so he could still see at least a little. He arrived at the village in the late afternoon to find it bustling with activity. Far more activity than he remembered, actually. Frowning, he stopped one of the passing villagers, a masked man a little taller than him. What was going on? Oh, Hashira-san, the man said with a bow. We are packing up the village to move as the Corps has reported that we may have been discovered. We are moving as a precaution, hence why you did not need to be carried here. We no longer need to keep it secret. It should take us about a week to move everything we need to, though, so enjoy your stay here. We have been expecting you, after all. That might explain why the man seemed so nervous and polite. Tanjiro blinked. Oh, thank you. He returned the other man's bow and watched him head off, very quickly, before he continued his walk down the road. He wasn't sure the swordsmiths had been discovered yet, but it wasn't a bad precaution especially as they were expecting an attack by Kazuki in the near future. He wondered if the moving would work, though. Or would an empty village just alert Musen that something was wrong? Would he hunt and track down the villagers so he could find the new village? He hoped not. A strong presence, along with the smell of wet earth and stone, brushed his senses and he looked up to see Haimjima walking towards him. He grinned despite knowing the other man couldn't see him. Haimjima-san, 
he called out. Several people near him gasped, likely due to spotting his teeth, but he ignored them and hurried towards the stone Hashira. Kamado-san, the man said politely, if coolly. Then said man tipped his head, likely listening, and then frowning. Are you alone? Oh, yeah, Tenjiro said, rubbing the back of his head a little nervously. Oyakata-sama said he trusted me to come on my own and that he didn't have any Hashira or Kino available to accompany me. The larger man didn't look happy at that, but he merely let out a soft hum before turning and stalking back down the street. This way. Hi, Haimjima-san. You are here to train under me, correct? Yes, sir, Tanjiro said as he hurried to keep up with the tall Hashira's long strides. Because you want to perfect your style, which is where my style supposedly comes from. Yup, Tum, as I cannot see your stances or any mistakes you may be making, I will simply have to teach you my style, and allow you to fix any problems in your own style yourself. Tanjiro actually stopped walking as that hit him, mouth dropping open in shock. Then he ran to catch up with the man. You would do that. He asked quietly, Oyakata-sama has specially requested that I help you, so I will. The time traveler felt a bubble of warm hope begin to form in his heart. Thank you so much, Haimjima-san. Sensei, if you are to learn under me, you must do as I ask. Therefore, call me Sensei. Tenjiro couldn't help his beaming grin. Hi, Haimjima-sensei. The older man seemed to slump a little, like he wasn't looking forward to their future interactions. So Tenjiro hadn't convinced him of his intentions yet. Fine, he'd just have to work extra hard to do so. You should know that this is not me declaring you as a Tsuguko. I know you will not be using the stone breathing form in the future, and thus you are simply a student, much like Shina's Yugawa Jenya. Tenjiro blinked and paused for a moment before hurrying to catch up again. He hadn't thought of it as Tsuguko training himself as he was already a pillar, but it made sense that Haimjima saw. Sensei would want to establish something like that from the beginning. Of course, Haimjima Sensei, I thank you for your willingness to help me. Hum, the man nodded. Silence fell between them for a moment before the taller man spoke again. I do have one request while you stay here, the stone pillar said slowly, and if it had been anyone else, Tenjiro would have thought unsurely. Oh, the sun pillar asked. Jenya is here. Please, try to stay away from him. Tenjiro's beaming smile faded and he looked down sadly. Jenya was his friend. It hurt to be on such bad terms with him. Still, the request was probably for the best, after all. Hi, Haimjima-sensei. The taller man nodded firmly. Good, let me show you to the rooms you'll be using. Hi, sensei. XXX. Akatsugi wasn't quite sure what to think of the new arrivals. One of them was at Tsuguko and the other a prodigy, having been raised in the mountains and somehow developed a breath style of his own. It wasn't a small feat but, you have to train harder. The boy with the boar head yelled at the crying blonde. Really, no one outside of a demon should have hair that bright. Even Kenroji's hadn't been quite like that. Harder, the second boy shrieked. I've been training years longer than you. You have not. Besides, you fainted on the way here. Again, the first boy shrieked, stomping his foot on the ground angrily. I had to carry you, again. Akatsugi turned to Kyojiro who stood beside him, also watching the boys interact with that insane grin of his. It did look more contemplative than usual. Was he learning to read the guy? Or, Suguko's always like this. Of course not, Rengoku said boisterously. I most certainly wasn't like this. Somehow, the demon didn't quite believe that. Before Akatsugi could say anything else, though, the first boy's voice cut through their conversation. It seemed he'd spotted them because he stood facing them, knees bent and swords out as he pointed one at the pair of them, specifically at the former waxing third. Huh, hey you, demon, fight me. Akatsugi blinked in surprise, then glanced at Kyojiro. The flame Hashira just shrugged. Don't kill them, or permanently maim them. He still sounded so. Upbeat, how did he do it? The demon stared at his companion for several seconds before he shrugged. Why not? Sure, this way, he said, heading towards the more open back of the estate. The boar-headed boy laughed in delight and hurried after him. Well, he had guts and motivation in spades. Perhaps this would be an entertaining fight after all. Once they reached the open yard, Akatsugi turned to the boy and took a stance. Give me everything you got. The boy grinned. He could sense it under the boar mask. I will. The following fight would have been a slaughter had Akatsugi actually been trying. He beat the boy easily, but he had to admit he was impressed. The kid had come up with his own breathing style, and it had a lot of potential. You said your style of breathing is the beast form. He asked as he leaned over the kid sprawled on the ground. Yeah, what, of it? The boy answered between heaving breaths. Akatsugi grinned. Reminds me of the wind pillar's style. Would you teach it to me? I made it up myself. The boy insisted, but then he calmed and forced himself to sit up. 
Sure, I'll teach you. Just acknowledge me as best boss. The demon blinked, then snorted softly, not seeing much harm in humoring the boy. Sure, boss. Once again, he could almost feel the grin on the other's face as he got to his feet. All right, this is how I do it. I breathe in like this, and breathe out like this. Then he fell silent. Akatsuga's face fell. It was supremely unhelpful. And what do you do with those breaths, though? He pushed. I make my arms and legs stronger, of course. The kid lifted his arm in a square and squeezed the muscles on his upper arm. Akatsugi just stared at him for several seconds before he sighed. This would be harder than he thought. Nezuko watched her sister practice her sword swings worriedly. She'd been at that for almost three hours now. She'd gone up and down the mountain for the first time the day before and had been nothing but frustrated with her performance. Yurikodaki sensei had even told her she needed to be patient with herself, but that had only resulted with a stony nod. And once Hanako thought no one was looking, she broke down into tears. Was that something Rengoku-san had said? The younger Kamado girl knew the breathing forms for the flame style but could only seem to practice them for a couple of minutes at a time and she didn't seem to have the power she would need to truly cut off a demon's head. It was a stage Nezuko remembered vividly. Hanako had also thrown herself into learning the Hinakami Kegura, but trying to move with that breathing form had knocked her out for an entire afternoon. She still practiced the stances along with the flame breathing, but hadn't tried the breathing style for the sun breath again, at least. But now she was working herself to the bone. Nezuko hadn't interfered before because who was she to discourage such dedicated effort, but this wouldn't help in the long run, and they all knew it, except for her little sister, apparently. Sighing, she walked into view and smiled at Hanako, who didn't stop swinging. Nezuko knew her smile became slightly more strained. Hanako, can we talk? She asked. Just a sec, the girl said, eyes narrowed in concentration. Her arms were shaking. Nezuko still waited for several more swings before the girl finally let her hands drop to her sides and turned to her sister wearily. What is it? Ni Chan. She sounded so. Well, somehow both emotionless and yet intense, both calm and angry. Part of that might have been her being so out of breath. I'm worried about you, Hanako, she said quietly. The younger girl scowled. Why? Because of how hard you're pushing yourself. The scowl deepened. I thought that no one became a demon slayer without training nearly to death. Not when they're nine. What does my age have to do with it? Hanako asked angrily, stomping her foot on the ground. Nezuko sighed. Because if you push yourself too hard right now, you could hurt yourself to a point where you can't use a breathing form, or so permanently that you can't take a proper stance, or swing a sword right. That seemed to get through to the girl as she looked horrified, and then away. What does the difference between being nine and ten have to do with that? She muttered and were those tears in her eyes. The older girl wanted to groan, but refrained. To be honest, she said as patiently and lovingly as she could, I don't know. I just know that Rengoku-san had his reasons, and maybe we should listen to them. Hanako shook her head defiantly. I have to get stronger. Nezuko closed her eyes. She'd thought that might be the reason. Hanako was blaming herself for Rengoku-san's death. She walked over and put her arms around her sister, who resisted for a moment before melting into the hug. It wasn't your fault, Nezuko whispered. The younger girl shook her head. If I'd been stronger, do you expect Rokita to be able to run as quickly as you? That seemed to take Hanako by surprise as she pulled away to look up at her sister with wide eyes. No, of course not. He's a baby. Well, I wouldn't count five years old as a baby, but I think my point still stands. If you don't expect strength from him, how can you expect yourself to measure up to Rengoku-san? Hanako closed her mouth and looked down. It isn't your fault you were born when you were. It isn't anyone's fault, really. It just is. Be but it isn't fair, Hanako cried. Nezuko hugged her tighter. No, it isn't. Nothing regarding demons is fair. And it's terrifying. The younger girl grabbed Nezuko's Hayori, clutching it tightly and sobbing. Hey, he's gone and it was for me. I don't want to lose anyone else. Tears sprang to the older sister's eyes too. I know, but that still doesn't make it your fault. That makes it Musen's fault. And the waxing moon that attacked you but never yours. They sat like that for several minutes, with Hanako just sobbing into Nezuko's chest, practice sword lying forlornly on the ground next to them where the younger girl had dropped it. How about this? Nezuko said when Hanako had finally calmed a little. You stop sneaking off to do more practice, and we'll push you harder in our training sessions. But you have to take time to play with Rokuda and Shidru every day, at least. And if you don't want to play with them and just want to sit around for a while, that's fine too. Irokodaki sensei has set up a shrine for Rengoku-san, too, you know, if you want to take time to pray. She wasn't sure her sister knew that as she'd been that involved in her training. 
It was in the corner of the common room in the house, but Hanako was never inside except when she was half asleep waking up or dead on her feet going to bed. She often even ate outside. Sure enough, Hanako looked surprised. He has, of course, Nezuko said, smiling. Let me show you. The younger girl nodded emphatically. Pick up your sword. Nezuko nodded towards the wooden sword on the ground. Hanako nodded again, wiping the last of her tears away before grabbing her sword and then hurrying after her older sister. For the first time since they'd returned to Mount Sejiri, Nezuko allowed herself to relax. Hanako wasn't good now, but she would be alright eventually. XXX. Shinazugawa Jenya couldn't sleep. Not when he knew Kamado was in town. Probably in the same building, he realized with a shudder. It didn't help. He hated that he couldn't seem to relax because he'd worked hard that day and his body begged for rest, but... How could he let himself relax when that thing was around, waiting for them to all lower their guards? Not that Haimjima Sensei would lower his guard, but Haimjima Sensei was also teaching the demon his style. Admittedly, that was under orders, but still. If Haimjima Sensei had said no adamantly enough, he didn't think the Demon Slayer Corps would push him on it. Genya had even spied on the training session today. Kamado caught onto the Earth style very, very quickly. It was terrifying and he just couldn't understand why the core was buying into all of this. The demon would probably have the style completely down in days. That was just, he wanted to do something about it but, what, short of sneaking in and killing Kamado while he slept. The young demon slayer leaned up on one elbow and looked over at his sensei sleeping calmly, body straight under his blanket. Then he sighed. Genya had tried sneaking out before, but had only ever succeeded when Sensei allowed it. He had no delusions that he'd be allowed outside of his room tonight. He huffed and lay back on his futon. Sensei's here. He told himself. He won't allow anything to happen. Genya sighed and shook his head. Now if only I could truly believe that. He didn't know how long he lay there looking up at the ceiling, heart pounding at the thought of a demon nearby, on the other side of the shoji. Could he really be so close? He sincerely hoped not. He must have eventually drifted off because he woke up the next morning. What sleep he got didn't help him feel much better. He still forced himself to get up and begin his morning routine after which Sensei set him on his training for the day. Before he left to go train Kamado some more, the large man turned an ear to Genya. You know, he said, obviously listening carefully, you'd probably get a lot more information about Kamado if you would treat him like a person. He's a demon, yes? He can also speak and talk and would likely open up to you far more than he would to me. Jenya didn't say anything. Something to consider, his teacher said passively before he walked out. The younger demon slayer grit his teeth and went about his training until lunch. Sensei never came to eat the portion he set out for him. Probably too busy with the demon. Well, that was fine. It wasn't like he needed his sensei for everything. He trained all afternoon and only when he'd finally almost collapsed from the exercises and the sun was well on its way to the horizon did he allow himself to pause and just look out at the town for a moment. They expected a demon attack here within a couple of days. Even now, the village looked to be half empty with everyone scurrying about to get all the equipment and supplies out of there. Of course, that was all based on information provided by Kamado. Genya sighed and turned to go to the hot springs. He didn't know when he'd be able to next use them after all, and he really needed it. Unfortunately, he'd gotten undressed and stepped into the hot tub area only to turn around and see one Kamado Tanjiro half submerged in the pool relaxing against the stones containing the water. The demon looked up through the steam at the sound of the door opening, bright red eyes and Kanji meeting Genya's dark purple. They both sat there looking at each other in shock for several seconds before Kamado stood up hurriedly. I'll go. He quickly got out of the hot spring and grabbed for what must have been his nearby towel. Part of Genya wanted him to go. Very much. Part of him wanted to start a fight. But most of him remembered what his sensei had said earlier that day. Did he want Genya to try and get information out of Kamado? And why did he think the demon would open up to him more than a Hashira? Oh, well, Genya wasn't sure what the kid would actually divulge to him but if they could potentially get the information they needed. No, he forced himself to say through gritted teeth as Kamado went to rush by him. The demon stopped uncertainly. No, Genya took a deep breath. You can stay. A troubled expression crossed the other boy's face. I was told to avoid you. I thought you wanted me to. He thumbed over his shoulder. The taller boy took a deep breath and shook his head. He really wasn't good at this, so he couldn't force a neutral expression. But he could at least not antagonize the demon. That's if one of us was gonna start a fight. Are you gonna? Kamado blinked and turned more towards Genya. No. Yeah, I won't either. The kid suddenly looked far too hopeful. Really, I wouldn't say it otherwise. Genya snarled, then turned and marched angrily towards the pool and got in, making sure he never once turned his back on the demon. 
Reluctantly, Kamado lowered himself back into the pool and sat stiffly for several seconds before leaning his head back and exhaling, seeming to forcibly relax himself. Jenya tried to do the same with only some success. The silence between them felt awkward and heavy, but Jenya didn't know what to say to try and break that. Kamado didn't seem to want to, just relaxing against the hot stones. I didn't know something like this would appeal to demons, the taller slayer finally said, and then immediately mentally kicked himself. That was not in any way cordial. Not that Jenya or any Shinazugawa as far as he could remember was cordial, but still. Kamado lifted his head had he really been that open to attack. Was he that confident, that arrogant, and peered at Jenya with those glowing irises? Why wouldn't it? Because as far as he could tell, demons only cared about eating humans, to a point where they didn't seem like they could care about anything else sometimes. He could at least see that saying that wouldn't go over well, so he shrugged instead, hoping that any redness on his cheeks from embarrassment would be passed off as the heat from the pool. Kamado studied him for a couple of seconds before smiling softly. Demons can regenerate very quickly, and so we don't get muscle pains, but it still feels good and is relaxing. Oh, was all Jenya could say. No, he couldn't leave it there. At least they'd had something going. It is relaxing. He really sucked at this. They sat in that stilted silence for several more seconds. Kamado had leaned his head back against the stone again, closing his eyes. After a couple of minutes he opened one of them and saw Jenya staring at him. The human looked away, probably too quickly. Then Kamado sighed. If you have questions, you can ask them. Just, don't insult my family and we'll be fine. Jenya glanced back again, eyes narrowed. Should he? Well, he was supposed to get information. You can burn selective things, right? Kamado blinked, and then nodded in resignation, as if he knew where this was going. Well too bad. Have you even tried to burn your cells out? Of your brother? Kamado asked hesitantly. Jenya grit his teeth and nodded, feeling proud of himself for not snarling again at the mention of Sainmi. To his surprise, Kamado sighed and nodded. Yeah, we did some tests. Sane me and every other demon I turned, he looked sick. Good. Well, we're resistant to Shinobu-san's poison. The first time I burnt the cells out of a demon, the sheer pain killed them. That was one of Musen's demons. It would take me at least twice as long to burn the cells out of Sane me. The cells are resistant to my powers seeing as they are my power. He paused and looked down at his hands sadly. After a couple of seconds, he looked up and grinned again. It looked real. It was. Scary. Fortunately, Shinobu-san is working on some more potent poisons that will incapacitate and not kill, so hopefully in a couple of months, that shouldn't be an issue. We can just knock Sanmi out, burn the cells out of him and he should be back to normal. Jenya just stared. Because really, he didn't want to get his hopes up but, just like that, Kamado shrugged. I hope so. If not, we'll find a way. That wasn't what he'd been expecting. You'd lose a demon. You know that, right? The red-eyed kid grinned at Jenya. Yup. And he sounded excited. Jenya was getting nowhere fast. Right about then, he realized that this would take longer than he had thought it would. XXX. How was your visit to the hot springs? Haimjima sensei asked when Jenya got back to their shared room. Instead of answering, the younger demon slayer stumbled past him and flopped onto his futon, face first then groaned into the small, round pillow. Haimjima blinked, ear directly to Jenya. Did you get injured? He asked worriedly, tears already starting to drip down his cheeks. You should have come to me directly. Don't put yourself through unnecessary pain. No, Jenya said quickly, then sighed and slumped back down. No, I didn't get hurt. I did run into Kamado. Instead of responding, the stone Hashira whipped out his beads and began to say a mantra. Jenya rolled his eyes and turned back down on the pillow. I am relieved you came out of the encounter unscathed, his sensei finally said. Jenya frowned and turned to look at the man. You thought he'd attack me. Haimjima sensei blinked. No, I thought you'd attack him and he would respond in kind. The younger slayer scowled. Yeah, well I didn't. You said to treat him like a person so we could get information out of him. His teacher paused, as if studying Jenya. Did you gain any insight or information? Jenya huffed. No, nothing useful in any case. He insisted that he wants to help Sanmi and all his other demons become human again. He told me he wants to become human again. Then he told me the most ridiculous thing about waking up every time he died on the same day over and over again. At this point, I don't know what is real or not. I think he wanted to just confuse me. He sighed and waited for words of wisdom from his teacher, a way to hopefully cut through the insanity and discover the actual truth. When only silence reached him, he looked at his teacher again. Sensei, so, he told you. Wait, what? You know about that? Haimjima nodded. I do. He informed oyakata sama almost three years ago and has had proof that is difficult to ignore. Jenya couldn't help but stare, 
open-mouthed. Wait, it's actually true. The taller man nodded gravely. We believe so. But, I, the, what was Jenya supposed to do with this information? It boggled the mind. He dropped his head into his hands. I have to admit, I am very proud of you for keeping your head when speaking with Kamado, Jenya. He didn't look up. Thank you, Sensei. Hmm, I am curious, though. You seemed distressed when you entered. He was distressed now. Why? Oh, yeah, that. He wanted to know if I wanted to experiment with eating his hair and nails and stuff. See if that worked for me to eat him and his demons too. Ugh, the very idea made his stomach turn. And yet, the pair sat in silence for several seconds. Are you going to? The blind man finally asked. Jenya sighed. Yeah, probably. It'll be good to know if nothing else. I would like to oversee this. Training. Both he and Kamado had expected that, and neither one had a problem with it. Honestly, having his sensei there would be a load off of his mind. That would be welcomed, sensei. The larger man nodded firmly, and then the silence returned. Sensei. Jenya finally said quietly, I don't think he's hiding anything. He hated to admit it, and he'd still never forgive the guy for what he did to Sanmi. But, hmm, Haimjima sensei replied thoughtfully. We shall see, I suppose. Jenya let out a tired sigh. Yeah, I guess. Let us go and eat. That will make you feel better, Haimjima sensei said as he stood up. Well, Jenya wasn't sure if he agreed, but it was something, he supposed. Ignoring his still sore body, he stood as well. Hi, sensei. Takio stepped into the sunlight and breathed easily for the first time in far too long. The world began to blur as the wariness, fear and determination he'd been running on for hours finally began to wear off, and he slumped. He needed sleep, badly. He'd just finished his third night at the final selection, thankful to have reached the morning of the third day, especially seeing as he'd only been able to grab maybe two to four hours of sleep each of the days prior. That would change today, one way or another. He doubted he could stop himself from collapsing when he finally let his body stop. Fortunately, he'd be able to relax in a large clearing he'd stumbled across about an hour ago. It happened to be one of the biggest, most open meadows he'd run across so far. The clearings didn't happen too often, so he was thankful he finally had a place that would be relatively safe. He may just stay here through tonight too. If he got to the location on the seventh day a little late, so be it. At least he'd get there alive. Something about that didn't sound right in his head but he couldn't figure out what. His brain didn't want to work. He'd managed to kill three demons though. Three. He may have a couple of nasty scratches on his upper back because of it. But he thought he was doing pretty well, all things considered. He hoped he didn't have a problem with infection like Nezuko had before she'd left the final selection. He shuddered. He really hoped his final selection would go better and he didn't run into even bigger problems, like waxing moons, which wasn't an impossibility, and that was something he had to be prepared for. The demons may go after him to get to Nyaisan. He shuddered, but the thought seemed to slip from his head because he was just too tired. Besides, so far, everything seemed to be going okay, so maybe he'd think about this all when he woke up later. Yeah, he found a nice hill to lay on, fell to his knees, and made himself comfortable by taking off his Hayori and using it as a pillow, even putting the large sleeve over his head so he could keep the sunlight off. It still took him far too long to get to sleep, but eventually he drifted off, hoping he could rest well enough to make the next leg of the journey tonight. <laughs> Wait, wasn't he going to stay here? No, he liked it here. Here was nice. And warm. Warm was good. He didn't notice the man with the half and half Hayori watching him from the trees as he finally fell into the slumber he needed. XXX. Jiu watched the Kamado boy as he stumbled into the field and practically collapsed there. He approved. It would be a good, safe place to sleep, and he obviously needed it. He would likely only be able to sleep until late morning at best, but even in his sleep-deprived state, he'd been aware enough to find the best place to go. Smart child. And strong. He'd killed at least three demons so far and only had minimal wounds to show for it. Quite impressive. Even if he stumbled around loudly and clumsily and practically projected where he was at all times. Was this what I was like back then? He asked himself before he realized that no, he'd likely been much worse. So bad, he'd had to be rescued. He shook the unpleasant memory from his head. Best not to go there. For the first time in three days, Jiu finally allowed himself to relax. The Kamado boy was safe. That was all that mattered. He'd been given explicit instructions to keep an eye on the child. They still didn't know if a waxing moon would come, and it was likely that the boy would be a target if one did. So here he was, keeping most of his attention on this one hopeful while the new mist pillar ran around the forest, trying to save the others in this selection. It had been a larger crowd than normal, probably because of the returning failures from the last selection. That could be both a boon and a problem. 
Still, Takedo insisted he could keep the others safe, so Jiyu let him. Truthfully, he was glad he'd been assigned guard duty right now. It wasn't the most exciting work, but he'd never been in this for excitement. He liked the idea of being able to keep one of his potential Tsugukos one of his water brothers safe, and may or may not be looking forward to escorting said boy home so he could help them and his sensei, and the rest of the Kamados move at the end of the week. He wanted to see that familiar place from his memories one last time. Thinking of Yurikodaki Sensei anywhere but on Mount Sajiri felt strange, surreal, even. He also knew it would be difficult to uproot the Kamado family again, making them leave their home again in such a short time. But better to be safe, as Sensei had said. Jiyu let out a yawn. He may be looking forward to the end of the week, but he had an assignment to fulfill now. He was determined to keep the boy safe, which was why he almost found himself smiling when he watched said boy breathe deeply on top of the small, grassy mound he'd found. The boy was safe and would be for several hours. After some consideration, Jiyu decided to catch a nap of his own. He had four more nights of this, after all, and if a waxing moon did show up, he would need to be at the top of his game. Taking one last look around, Jiyu found there were no demons near and leaned against the tree trunk, quickly slipping off into a light doze. XXX. Jiyomai had to admit, he was surprised. No, more than surprised. He was downright shocked as he listened to the two boys currently under his tutelage interact. They did so in terse, matter-of-fact sentences, but they were communicating well and neither one seemed to be afraid to voice their thoughts and opinions to the other. It was refreshing, but baffling. Just how had Kamado convinced Genya to stop being so hostile so quickly? To actually stop and think about things from his point of view. Oh, Genya was still angry, still seething, to be honest, but he was also more thoughtful. Dare he think considerate. The stone Hashira seriously considered asking the demon what had happened and how, but couldn't really figure out how to bring it up without sounding accusatory currently. How did you get him on your side? Sounded bad from every angle, even if he didn't think the boy would take offense. He was trying to be more open-minded about Kamado, even as he continued to look for the truth. He wanted to keep his biases out of it. The sun pillar had earned that much at least. He watched the two boys training together, Kamado working on making his arms and fingers grow or change shape while happily handing over clumps of hair for Genya to eat. The human boy transformed over and over and over again, figuring out his own abilities as a temporary demon, which, admittedly, had been difficult to do before. And thankfully, he was still a temporary demon. The whole experiment had actually gone over very well, as far as he knew. Genya said he felt faster, stronger and better able to heal than he did with normal demons, but burned through it quickly. None of them really had a problem with that. Kamado had even volunteered to give the boy a stash of hair and nails so Genya could carry it around and transform at will. The taller boy had readily accepted. It was incredible. The more they went on, the less and less angry his student sounded and that honestly felt like a miracle. He wondered if some sort of emotional tie had developed there. He'd heard about the one Kamado had with both Shinazugawa and Akatsugi. But did that mean there was a connection with Kamado when his student transformed? That worried him, and he made plans to speak with Genya later that evening. However, at that moment, he saw little to worry about and significant progress had been made by both parties from what he could hear. Nodding, Jiyomai decided that, for now, it was time to get them to train in more than flesh manipulation and demonic transformation. Kamado-san, Genya, he called to them. He heard them shifting, likely to look at him. It is time to begin our normal training. He heard a very enthusiastic, hi, Haimjima sensei from Kamado and a groan from Genya. He had to stop himself from smiling. That was just too amusing. A couple of minutes later had Genya working with boulders again as Kamado went through the stone forms. It was amazing how quickly the boy had picked them up and even said he was beginning to see where he could modify his sun breathing style to be more efficient, and, in this case, powerful. Even if he was a demon, Jiyomai couldn't help but feel a little proud. They had just started on their third round of the stone forms when Kamado spoke. Paimjuma Sensei, I have a spiritual question for you. Jiyomai couldn't help but be a little startled at that. Yes, he asked, turning his head in the boy's general direction. When I tried to infiltrate the Kazuki's upper ranks in previous loops, well, he marked my eyes. Yes, the Buddhist monk said with a firm nod. He didn't have to see it every time he looked at the boy like everyone else, but he'd heard Kazuki described often enough. He'd also heard Kamado described often enough. Tameo-san thinks that this followed me in my demon transformation across time because he marked my spirit. Ah, uh, Jiyomai thought he had an idea of where this was headed. You wish to nullify the mark. Yes, Kamado said, letting the word out in a relieved sigh. 
Jayomai thought about that. Did he know anything that could potentially rid the boy of his mark? A mark on his soul by a demon progenitor. He thought and thought, but nothing really came to mind. The only thing he could really do was give the boy the tools to figure it out on his own. He had no idea if the prayers and mantras he had would work. And even if they did, they may hurt Kamado as much as help him seeing as he was a demon as well, and the mark was most likely demonic in nature. I can teach you some meditation techniques that should give you access to your soul under the right circumstances, he finally said. However, I know of no technique to cleanse a mark such as that. You will have to figure that out on your own, he warned. The boy didn't answer for several seconds, likely thinking about Jayomai's proposal. Finally, he heard the son Hashira take a deep breath. Thank you, Haimjima Sensei. I would gratefully accept your offer. Well, he could certainly appreciate that kind of dedication. We will begin after lunch, then, Jayomai said. Which was actually good. He'd been wondering what else he could do to help Kamado train more since he'd caught onto the Forzum so quickly and had gone through all other forms of training very easily. Before then, you need to. He stopped and turned when he heard someone running up to them, stomping hurriedly through the brush. Hashira-sama. Hashira-sama. One of the smiths shouted to them. He was out of breath by the time he reached them. Tekakawahara-sama has asked me to find you. A boy named Kotsu has gone missing. We don't know if this is some act of rebellion on his part or the beginning of the attack you anticipated despite the time of day. Jayomai stiffened. The idea of a child getting lost and eaten by a demon. Again, just, he shook his head, trying to banish the sounds of the memories of his own children crying out and screaming. Then he turned to the man and nodded. We will begin searching immediately. The smith sounded incredibly grateful as he let out a whoosh of air. Thank you, Hashira-sama. Jayomai nodded again, then turned to Kamado. I'll take the north side of the village, the boy said. You get Jenya and take the east and south sides. We can meet and search the west if we do not find him in an hour. I doubt it is an attack as it is still daylight. Jayomai nodded once. A good plan. If it is an attack, get to the alarm bells and sound them. Hi, Haimjima Sensei. And with that, the boy was gone. Haimjima could barely sense him sprinting away. He approved. He had to admit, the boy was winning him over as well. With that on his mind, he sighed and turned to find Jenya. They had to find this child before another tragedy struck. XXX. Kotsu ignored the pangs of hunger in his stomach as he sat in the forest, head buried in his arms. Not that it would help as he still had his stupid mask on, but he felt naked without it and the position felt right. Or, well, Ryder, he'd just have to wait here until everyone left. Even if, he gulped and looked at the lifeless puppet at his side, hidden as best he could get it in some rocks. Was this really worth it? Being alone for the rest of his life with the puppet. But it was the only link to his family and it was his responsibility. Why did they want to leave it behind? Just because it was getting weaker didn't mean it wasn't worth taking. It was still strong. It was still an excellent training tool. It was just, why? He remembered his father's strong figure, but his gentle hands when he carried Kotsu around. He remembered all the stories his father used to tell him about the mechanical, fighting doll, and how it was their family's pride and joy. About how, Kotsu Kun, a voice he'd never heard before had him jumping, screaming and scrambling to get away. There you are. An older boy dropped down from the treetops in front of him. All Kotsu saw was that he wore a green and black checkered Hayori and a blindfold. However, that was about all he got from the short glimpse he saw. Because the guy just appearing there did nothing to help his beating heart. That hadn't calmed down, or his brain screaming at him to just run. So that was what he did. He turned and ran. K. Kotsu Kun. The voice called out. Kotsu didn't listen, instead scrambling up a tree to the nearest tree branch and just holding onto the trunk in front of him for dear life as he tried to force himself to breathe. He even slid his mask up and to the side. It helped, a little. He heard the guy come and stop at the base of his tree, slowly, and look down, warily. I'm sorry I scared you, Kotsu Kun. It's just that Tekakawahara-san was very worried. The other demon slayers and I were asked to find you because we were worried you'd been attacked by a demon. Well, they were expecting a demon attack soon, hence why everyone was moving. So that made sense, but he'd hoped he'd be able to hide from them. He silently cursed. Who even are you? He yelled down after a moment, angry now that his fear had begun to subside. It was just like that old man to send someone after him when he didn't want anyone to find him. Oh, and the son Hashira, Kamado Tenjiro. Kotsu stiffened. He'd heard about that one. Th th the demon. His voice may or may not have squeaked, but who could blame him? He couldn't protect himself against a demon. The guy sighed, reached up and pulled the blindfold down to reveal two glowing eyes with kanji written in them. Waxing zero. Kotsu's heartbeat quickened, the fear back but far deeper than a sudden scare. 
am still a demon slayer too. You know, the newcomer said with the kindest, warmest smile Kotsu had ever seen on anyone. It didn't match. Demons weren't supposed to look like that. Honestly, Kotsu didn't know what to say, because what the Hashira said was true. This guy was a demon slayer, but he was also a demon. But they said he didn't eat humans, but that made no sense. The thing that really got him to pause and consider the older boy was the fact that he hadn't done anything more than approach the tree. He had no doubt said demon could come and kill him whenever he wanted, but he was just standing there, looking imploringly up at the child on the tree branch. Why did you run away, Kotsu-kun? With Yorichi Type 02, that brought the boy up short. This demon knew about the puppet. Then he wanted to kick himself. Of course he would. He was a Hashira. Why do you care? He asked, voice far too quiet. But the demon Hashira picked it up anyway. Because it obviously upset you enough that you'd come out here, risking a demon attack, to get away from whatever upset you. That sounds pretty important. Well, he had a point. And the guy was a Hashira, so he had to be trusted. Right? Even if he was a demon. And Kotsu had been holding this in all day and they said they didn't have room for Yorichi Type 0. He practically cried out, feeling tears come to his eyes again. And it can't walk that far. If, if there's no room, I'll have to leave it behind and I can't. It belongs to me and my family. I have to maintain it. I'm not leaving it behind. The demon boy blinked. So you ran into the forest with it when there might be a demon attack. Well, when he put it that way, but what choice do I have? I'm not leaving it. He insisted. Kimado looked thoughtful for several seconds. There has to be a misunderstanding. Your puppet is very valuable to the village and the core. I can't believe they'd want to leave it behind. Tekikawahara Sama himself told me there's no room. Kotsu protested angrily. Hum. The older boy nodded and glanced over his shoulder at where the puppet lay sprawled in. Oh, Kotsu was awful. Here he was determined not to leave the puppet behind and he just had. He was a terrible son and a terrible mechanic and a terrible. Okay, how about this? You come back to the village and I give you my word as a Hashira that Yurichi Type 0 will not be left behind. If I have to take it to your new village myself. Kotsu blinked. Had he just? Really? He asked in a small voice. Kamado smiled. Really? Now, will you come down out of the tree? For several seconds, Kotsu considered that. It was just that he felt safer up here but, for a moment, he didn't see the demon Hashira down below, but he saw his father. His father who wouldn't want him to run away and live on his own like this. Not even for the puppet. Stealing himself, he turned so that he could shimmy down the tree trunk until he reached the bottom. The Hashira remained there, not moving a muscle until both of Kotsu's feet were on the ground. Then he tipped his head to one side and smiled again, his Hanafuda earrings swaying with the movement. Now, how about I go get Yoriichi? and we can make our way back to the village. Okay, Kotsu said quietly, then watched as the Hashira made his way over to the puppet and lifted it easily, but also very, very gently, with the greatest of care. The future mechanic appreciated that more than he could say. It almost brought tears to his eyes to see how much care the Hashira was willing to give to his family's legacy. Are all Hashira like this? All right, let's get going, Kamado said, starting off towards the village. After a couple of seconds, Kotsu followed, staring at the boys back in wonder. Why was it that even though this guy was a demon, he seemed so much kinder than almost any other human he'd ever met? This had not been how he'd expected his attempt at running away to go. XXX. No, there wasn't room in that caravan. Kotsu, the village elder said as he put his hand on Kotsu's shoulder. The two of them had made good time back to the village and immediately come to find Tekakawahara-sama to see what they could do regarding the puppet. I would never make you leave behind your family's legacy. Kotsu felt both immensely relieved and incredibly stupid. Why hadn't he specified before? It was so simple. He felt tears coming to his eyes and sniffed. Really? He asked. Really, my boy? You are a valued member of this community. Please don't ever forget that. Then the tears came without Kotsu's permission and he began to heave shuddering breaths. How about I help you take the doll apart myself and we can make sure it's tucked away. Kotsu's relief began to recede again. B but if we take it apart, I don't know if I'll be able to make it work again. It's either that or somehow make it walk with us, the old man said gently. I watched your father take it apart to move it a couple of places, though, so I know it can be done. Oh, well, that made sense, but still. Actually, that brings something up I'd like to ask. Kamado spoke up, making Kotsu jump. He'd almost forgotten that the demon Hashira had brought him to Tekakawahara-sama and hadn't left. Oh, the village elder turned to the Hashira. What is it? Well, do you know how I became a demon? Kotsu suddenly felt supremely uncomfortable and saw the old man shift a little nervously too. Well, at least he wasn't the only one. 
I would assume the way most people do, the old man said slowly. Kamado let out a long sigh. Then he began on a story, summarized and obviously leaving out a lot of detail, but also fantastical and unbelievable. And yet, someone waking up again and again and again on the same day due to a demon blood art that wasn't out of the realm of possibilities. He'd heard of some really strange blood arts. Then the demon spoke about how, in his first life, he'd come across a 300-year-old sword inside that puppet with Kotsu's help. A Kotsu that wasn't this Kotsu because he obviously had no memory of that. And how weird was that? What? The boy yelped in shock. Tekikawahara Sama frowned. I've seen that doll in pieces and I don't recall a sword. I've seen it there in other loops too, Kamado insisted. And I know we came so close to defeating Musin in my first loop when I had the sword. I have all the faith in the sword I currently have, but we need the best shot we can get. With that, he got down on his knees and then bent his head down to touch the ground. Kotsu-san, I beg of you, please help me get that sword without destroying your family's legacy. Please help me stop Musin. Kotsu and the old man exchanged glances and then looked back at the demon prostrating himself before them. Kamado-san, Tekakawahara-sama said slowly, Even if that were true, you know it can take up to a month to sharpen a blade properly, correct? At that the older boy looked up and nodded, face determined. I do. I request you give it to Hagen Zukahadaru. I know he can have it done correctly within a couple of days if you give him the proper motivation. I know he does good work. The old man's eyebrows rose and Kotsu didn't blame him. No one wanted to work with Hagen Zuka, for good reason. And yet this boy, this demon, could they stop the demon threat with this? Was it worth trying? After some contemplation, Kotsu finally nodded. Yes, Kamado-san. I will help you. XXX. The sword was there, confined in the center column of the doll. Kotsu wondered how his life had become so strange in just a single afternoon. Genya was confused. He hated demons. He loved and respected his brother. Kamado was a demon who had turned his brother into a demon. He should hate the guy. He did hate him. And yet, he was just so nice and kind and hardworking and accommodating. It was hard to hate Kamado, at least now that he knew the guy. He'd watched the sun pillar perfect both the stone forms and his sun breathing style that morning. Now the kid sat quietly as he focused inward, determined to burn the mark off of his eyes or something. Genya still didn't think he'd been wrong to be angry at the guy for turning Sanmi into a demon, but he wasn't nearly as angry anymore, which kind of ticked him off. All of the initial anger had just sort of drained away. Now he, there he think it, he respected the guy. Genya still didn't know all of his story. But Kamado had been through so much and had chosen to fight for humans. How could he not respect that? Genya, he heard his sensei say. The younger demon slayer jumped and went back to pushing the boulders around. The only waterfalls around here were either too small or too warm to really train under, so they'd resorted to the boulder thing. Again, it was monotonous and boring, but it got results, he supposed. Hi, sensei. Sorry, sensei. Haimjima sensei nodded and went back to practicing the sun form Kamado had taught him. He'd said that out of everyone in the core, the stone pillar was likely the most able to use sun breathing. But sensei said it would take him months if not years to work up to a point where he could use the new breathing form. Not only was he used to stone breathing, but he had to learn the sun forms by feel and description only. It was possible. That was how he'd learned the stone style after all. But, well, not fast. He'd only been working on the first form again and again and again, and Genya could tell that it was taking its toll on his teacher. But if anyone beyond the Kamados could learn it, it would be Haimjima Sensei. That was something both he and Kamado agreed on. All three of them continued training in relative silence for another hour before the demon's eyes popped open, and he rose to his feet. Then he walked over to Genya, who was still breathing hard as he pushed the rocks around. Any change? He asked, pointing to his eyes. Genya hated to be the one with bad news, but Kamado couldn't exactly ask him Jima sensei The only slayer without a breathing style looked closely at the other boy's eyes, or more importantly, the kanji written in them. After a couple of seconds, he shook his head grimly. The kanji was still there and dark as ever. Kamado slumped, but nodded at the expected result. We still have some time before supper, Genya said, nodding to the sunset. Then he wondered why he was bothering. He hated this guy, right? He did. He did. <clears throat> yeah, but we also have someone to meet. The taller boy blinked. Oh, who? Kenroji Mitsuri, the love Hashira, is coming today. Haimjima Sensei spoke as he walked towards them, wiping the sweat off of his brow and breathing more heavily than normal. This guy threw around boulders like they were skipping stones, and he was breathing hard. Oh, Genya said. I assume she's here, then. The older man turned to Kamado, who nodded. 
then we should go greet her. She'll probably want to soak in the hot springs after her journey, the demon boy pointed out. Heimjima nodded. He would be good for all of us, I think. Kamado grinned and turned to bound down the hill. Are they friends? Jenya asked as he shook out his arms and legs. The sun pillar seemed rather excited. I believe so, Sensei said as he sheathed his sword. They followed at a far more subdued pace but still reached the town in a couple of minutes, only to see the spectacle of Kenroji almost crushing Kamado to death, or smothering him to her chest, or both. His arms flailed and she had made a high-pitched noise that kinda hurt Jenya's ears. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, she said over and over again. Jenya could swear Kamada was turning blue. Not that it would hurt him as a demon and all, but still. That had to be uncomfortable. Plus, she was a girl. Jenya kinda wanted to help a fellow guy out but even approaching her made it difficult for him to speak. Why was he like this? No, seriously, why? At least he could speak to Sensei, so he told him what was happening. Sensei looked as puzzled as Jenya felt. Kenroji-san, Heimjima-sensei called out. The woman paused and then, still holding Kamado to her chest, waved her hand. Why didn't he break loose? At least he seemed to be able to breathe again. Improvement, Jenya supposed. What is the meaning of this? The older Hashira asked, gesturing to Kenroji. Tenjiro got Obanai-san to meet me and we're officially setting up an Omiai. She finally let go of Kamado, who fell to the ground, gasping, and put her hands on her cheeks, letting out that loud squee again as her face went bright red. She looked so happy, and cute. Jenya couldn't help but feel his own face heat up in reaction. The younger demon slayer turned his head away as he tried to control his reaction, and everyone left in the village was staring at him. Well them, but it felt like they were staring at him and couldn't they look away. Why? He dropped his face in his hands. Kamado was coughing from where he knelt on the ground. Kamado-san, Heimjima-sensei spoke then, the frown in his voice obvious, are you all right? Oh. Jenya glanced back fast enough to see the shocked expression on the girl's face. Then he had to turn away again because that outfit. Ugh. He hated that he couldn't seem to think around girls. And sorry, Tenjiro. I. It's okay, he reassured, although his voice sounded a little raspy. Jenya was able to catch him out of the corner of his eye without seeing Kenroji-san if he turned just right and the boy was beaming and waving the girl's apologies away. I'm happy for you. Another squee. And Jenya had to look away again as the love pillar attacked Kamado with another hug. The boy went back to flailing his hands. That must be so uncomfortable. And embarrassing. Jenya really almost felt bad for him. Then it occurred to him, the girl didn't have any material on her front. And he was a demon, being crushed into said front. He wasn't doing anything malicious or remotely demonic despite the woman's flesh being right by his mouth. Hmm, maybe they could trust him. He quickly shook the thought from his head. Kenroji-san, Heimjima-sensei cut in again, likely having guessed what had happened. He was good at that. Why don't we have dinner and retire to the hot springs? That's a great idea, Heimjima-san. She replied happily. Kamado was gasping again, so at least he could breathe again. They all made their way back to the rooms the swordsmiths had lent them, Jenya trailing behind his sensei, who followed Kenroji and Kamado, who had fallen into a very energetic discussion about food, of all things once the demon had recovered from his near strangulation. Jenya, Heimjima sensei said quietly as the other two continued to talk animatedly. Hi, sensei, he said back, his voice coming out far lower and quieter than he would like. Please prepare yourself. Jenya frowned, and then dread settled over him. Had he forgotten something? For what? He asked. His teacher seemed surprised as he turned his head in the direction of his student. The hot springs. The younger demon slayer frowned. What about them? Heimjima sensei blinked. There's only one pool at the establishment we're staying at. Jenya's frown turned puzzled. I know that, sensei. We'll all be bathing tonight. It took him a minute to put it all together. He felt his face pale and he glanced at Kenroji san's back. Why you am mean? Yes, Jenya fainted. XXX. Obanai didn't really remember traveling to the Yubai Ashiki estate. He walked there in a bit of a daze, only barely remembering to take the circuitous routes that should throw off anyone following him. The just couldn't believe it. Mitsuri was more than open to a relationship with him. It boggled his mind. He'd even shown her his scars. It had been so surreal. She stared at him, just blinking every few seconds, but didn't respond. He instantly regretted asking her here and vowed to track Kamado down and utterly destroy him, demon or no. He would, few, would like, to set up an omiai. He suddenly felt so self-conscious, sitting at the table in the private room of the restaurant that had been reserved for them. Several bowls and trays of food laid out before them. Oh only if you would like to. He hurriedly amended, bracing himself for rejection. All he got was more blinking. 
Why didn't you approach my family? She asked, sounding confused. To be fair, that was more traditional, but... WWL, ugh, now he was stuttering too, I didn't want to if you didn't want to. That was when she frowned. Why would I not want to? His brain shut down. The only thought running through it was, what? Over and over again. Now it was his turn to stare at her. He couldn't believe she'd said that. He must have heard wrong. She must have realized he needed some explanation or time or whatever he actually needed because she looked down and opened her mouth. Do you know why I entered the Demon Slayer Corps? To find a husband. Or, she paused and her voice quieted a little, at least that's what I thought. After talking to Tanjiro, I realized that I just wanted a place where I belonged. I'm naturally very strong and I stand out because of it, to a point where other people are embarrassed to be around or with me. That's ridiculous. Obanai found himself saying angrily, leaning forward. She jumped at the sudden movement and he immediately backed off, looking away. S sorry. No, it's fine. She paused, putting a knuckle to her mouth and glancing up at him through her lashes. Why is that ridiculous? Obanai swallowed. WWL, anyone who thinks you're not incredible and awe-inspiring is absolutely stupid and they don't deserve you. You're amazing, Kanroji-san. Your strength is one of your best traits. I would admire you no matter what. I don't know if you're stronger than me or not, but I don't care. I could never love someone who didn't put all their strength behind their convictions. Oh no. She looked like she was about to cry. What did he do? Did he say something wrong? He felt panic begin to rise in his chest. I thought you wouldn't want to be with me. He blurted, realizing what he'd spoken only after he'd spoken it, and he felt his face drain of color. Going from blushing to pale couldn't be good on him. At least that's what the spots at the edge of his vision told him. He fought them away by focusing on the face of the girl sitting in front of him. Why would you think that? She asked a lot of questions. And, and he had to be honest with her to answer her. He didn't want to trap her in something she'd hate because of. Well, so he reached up and began to unwrap the bandages around his lower jaw. Once he finished he sat there, looking down, not wanting to see the disgust on her face. Oh, Igoro-san. No, Obanai-san. She wanted to call him by his personal name. What happened? So he told her everything. About being born into the clan, how he was a male child in a family of women and how outsiders were sacrificed to the snake demon who'd been treated like a goddess in his family, for their own gain. How, when he was twelve, he learned he was a sacrifice, only growing until he would be of edible age due to his strange eyes. How his family had cut his face from the tips of his mouth to the ears so he would look more like a snake to please the demon. How he'd managed to escape, and his entire family, except for his cousin, had been killed for it. How she berated him for escaping and how the entire family died because of him. Over fifty people. When he finished, they sat there and said nothing. She'd only eaten about half of what was on the table, and he knew that was a bad sign. This was a bad idea, he said, standing up. I'm sorry for wasting your time. You shouldn't be with someone as dirty as I am. What? She shrieked. The noise was so sudden it was his turn to jump and Kaburamaru tightened around his neck. So that must have startled him too. How can you say that? They were terrible people who sacrificed others and were going to sacrifice you just for being born. I don't care if they were all women, they can't just have babies on their own. How did they get pregnant? Where was your father? Your cousin's father? There was more going on there than you know and they were horrible people. No one should be sacrificed like that. It's a horrid practice that was done away with for a reason. Besides, you're incredible, Obanai-san. You took the most horrible part of your life, the snake demon's identity, and made it your own. You became the serpent pillar. Instead of letting it stop you, you took those scars and turned everything around. You're not dirty. I've never believed that a person should be blamed for their parents' mistakes. And I would be honored to arrange an omi with you. He just stood there for several seconds, staring at the girl who had risen from her seat, facing him and breathing hard, wearing the stockings he gave her because no one should walk around cold and... Wait, were those tears in his eyes? No, no, it couldn't be. He hadn't cried since. If you can accept me for being strong, just as strong as you are, then I can accept you with your past, she said, her voice quieter, and tears in her own eyes. Then she shot him a weak smile. But I might punch your cousin if I ever see her. Obanai didn't laugh often, or at all. He honestly couldn't remember the last time he laughed. But he did right then, ignoring how the stretching pulled at the scars on his cheeks. It hurt, a little, to laugh like that, but it also felt so good and cleaner than he'd ever felt too, like the nails of his dead family that he'd always sort of felt digging into his skin and dragging him down, melted away. They were still there, but they just didn't seem as important as they had before. For the first time in his life, he felt as if he could be whole, with a woman even, one of the few women he didn't absolutely despise. It felt healing, and that felt the best of all. 
he'd set up arrangements to go and visit her family the following week. He wasn't quite sure what he could present or why they should consider him to date their amazing, incredible daughter. But she assured him that they'd listen to him and likely be immensely happy and welcoming. He wasn't quite sure what to think of that. But then, he had little doubt she'd had incredible parents if she'd turned out like that. Especially the way she spoke of them. Who goes there? Someone called out. Obanai blinked and realized he'd arrived. Right? So he returned the call with the proper responses and was consequently hurried inside. He ran into Shinazugawa almost immediately. The Kakashi all gasped and backed away as the wind Hashira strode towards them. The sun had long since set and the moonlight shone off his bright hair, making him look like a wraith. So, you're finally back. He asked with that nonchalant drawl of his. Yeah, Obanai returned. Oyakata Sama's asleep. You can see him first thing tomorrow. The serpent pillar glanced at the Kakashi who all nodded in agreement. What took you so long? Shinazugawa asked in a tone that almost made the question confrontational and accusing. Did you run into demons? You mean, other demons? Obanai thought, but knew better than to say that aloud. Normally he would have replied that it was none of anyone's business, and that what had happened had happened. But part of him, the part that had been so high and free for the first time ever, couldn't be brought down, even by Shinazugawa's dour mood, and he wanted to share it. No, I met Kenroji-san. We're arranging an omiai. Shinazugawa blinked. Then he opened his mouth to say something, and then closed it. Finally he shrugged. Good. Obanai blinked. Good. He couldn't help but ask. Well, yeah. The demon replied with another shrug. You've been pining after her since the first time you saw her fight. Well, he wasn't wrong. Still, I didn't expect that answer from you, he said bluntly. Shinazugawa shrugged a third time. Nothing happened, so I don't really care. Do you want to train or sleep? He said it as if those two suggestions just happened to go together, like he hadn't changed the subject at all. Sleep, Obanai replied. It had been a long day. Shinazugawa nodded. Okay, he turned to the Kakashi. You heard the man. Then he turned to leave. The serpent pillar frowned. Shinazugawa-san. The demon paused and turned to him, slit purple eyes glowing in the darkness. It made for a terrifying picture, as was evidenced by the Kakashi backing away more. Are you the only pillar here? The white-haired man frowned. No, Rengoku's here too. He's training with the other demon and the brats. The other demon and the brats. The former waxing third. He asked. Shinazugawa rolled his eyes. Well, yeah. Who else did you think? It could have been a new demon Obanai hadn't met yet or Kamado even. There were other options. Still, Obanai didn't think pointing that out at the moment would be a good idea, or conducive to a still-standing estate by the end of the night. Obanai may agree with a lot of Shinazugawa's sentiments, but they had never been friends. Or, had they? Now that he thought back, he and Shinazugawa had spent a lot of time together, and he didn't dislike the man's company. Maybe he'd ask Rengoku. Maybe he'd ask Kamado the next time he saw the boy. So instead of snapping bluntly, he shrugged. Just making sure. TCH. Shinazugawa clicked his tongue. Whatever. Brats. Obanai pushed. The crybaby thundered Suguko in. I ain't sure what to say about the boarhead kid. He's got potential, I suppose. Oh. Them. Well, that explained everything, he supposed. So he turned to the Kakashi next to. The Kakashi who had been next to him but was now several feet behind him. Obanai clamped down on his usual lectures of weakness and dedication and cowardice. He was too tired and in too good of a mood. Please show me to my room. Yeah, later, Shinazugawa said, stretching one arm above his head. I'm going to sleep too. That took the serpent pillar by surprise. I thought that was dangerous. He might sleep through something important. Don't have a choice. Obanai frowned. Why not? The wind pillar tensed up, but then shrugged as he tried to look nonchalant. Not exactly a lot to eat around here if you get me. Uh, well, point, wake me up if something goes wrong, Shinazugawa said as he turned and continued walking back into the house. Yeah, Obanai replied, watching the white-haired Hashira disappear into the door frame. Wake him up, if they could. But it was better than the alternative. He was a little uncomfortable, knowing the demon had had free reign of the house with Rengoku out training. But he also trusted Shinazugawa, even now. Well, perhaps he should say the demon had earned some of Obanai's trust back. That wasn't an easy thing to do. So he turned to the Kakashi again. I'll take dinner in my room. That snapped the man out of his fear. Of course, sir, he said, taking some initially hesitant and then more confident steps in the same direction Shinazugawa had gone. Are we expecting any more Hashira anytime soon? He asked the dark-clothed people, wondering how thin they'd been stretched. Yes, sir, one of the Kakashi now following him, a woman this time, replied. 
We're expecting the Miss Pillar as soon as the final selection finishes. Oh, when will the final selection finish? He hadn't known they'd reinstated it. In three mornings, Iguro-sama, a third Kakashi replied as they stepped into the actual house and began to walk down the long, empty halls of the mansion. He'd probably get more information from Oyakata-sama in the morning. So for now, he just nodded and followed the Kakashi. He was looking forward to a hot meal, a bath, and then a night to himself when he could think about Mitsuri, the upcoming Omiyai, and, well, everything. It was so much to think about and take in. He allowed himself a small smile under the bandages he'd replaced. After all, no one but him would know it was there. Tanjiro stretched as he woke from the day-long sleep he'd just had. At least, he hoped it was only a day as the sun was going down again, much like when he'd gone to bed before. It had been a while since he slept that long. He must have used a lot of energy training the last few days. He felt so close to reaching the part of his soul marked by Musen, so close to burning that monster's mark away. And he'd gotten much better at manipulating his flesh in shape and function as well as size. He'd also managed to finish tweaking the sun breathing style. Now it was just a matter of practicing it until it was second nature, much like he'd been doing for the last few days of training. On top of that, Genya seemed to be warming up to him, and they hadn't woken him last night so no demon had attacked. All in all, he felt it had been a very productive training trip. Now all they needed to do was wait for the coming attack. Most of the villagers should be gone by now, with only a handful of volunteers left to keep up the image of some population. All of the forges had been moved even. They'd managed to prepare and had likely saved a lot of lives if the upcoming attack was anything like the one in Tenjiro's memories. His first life's memories, that had been so long ago, he was amazed he still remembered as well as he did, especially with the following loops. Shaking his head, he stood and got dressed. He'd slept as much as he needed. Now he'd have to train and patrol tonight. He'd just gotten done folding his bedding when the door behind him slammed open with a crack. He hadn't sensed anything unusual, no killing intent or demons, so it took him by surprise. Hey, wake up. People really shouldn't take him by surprise. He had the intruder pinned to the wall next to the door faster than he could really register anything. Claws flexed and ready to strike, mouth open and a threatening snarl. Then he realized who he'd pinned as the familiar mask fell off of the man's face, leaving a wide-eyed Hotaru Heijinazuka staring at him, although it seemed to be more out of shock than fear. Tenjiro dropped him immediately and backed off, holding his hands up in surrender. Sorry, you startled me. Um, don't do that. He really needed to work on his area awareness. He shouldn't have let his guard down just because it was still light out and he couldn't sense demons nearby. The swordsmith blinked again, then rotated his shoulder and scowled. Here's your sword. I spent the last three days and nights sharpening it, so take care of it. He pointed his finger very rudely at Tenjiro, who couldn't help but find it a little amusing. He'd just seen the demon Hashira almost attack him and was still acting like he had any power over the situation. Tenjiro still bowed as he took the sword. Thank you very much. I know you've done the best of work and I will use this sword with pride. The man harumphed, but Tenjiro could tell he was pleased. The sword smith nodded and then, without so much as a goodbye, turned and stomped away. The Hashira could only watch on in fond remembrance. At least the man wouldn't lose his eye this time. He hoped not, in any case. Even if only waxing four and five attacked this time, they still wouldn't be pushovers and depending on how quickly they were caught, they could still kill several of the remaining townsfolk. No, he told himself firmly as he took the sword out of its sheath and smiled at the familiar flame design. I will stop them whenever they attack. Besides, Mitsuri and Heimjima sensei were both here as well. They were prepared for whenever the attack happened, whether it happened tonight or in three months. Nodding, he finished cleaning up and then went down to begin practicing with this new sword. He wanted to get used to the weight as soon as possible. Maybe he'd find Genya. He and Heimjima sensei were probably either in the hot springs, patrolling or out training again, likely with Mitsuri. He checked the hot spring pool first, but found it empty, the lanterns that would usually be lit around this time dark and cold. He'd likely find them patrolling or in their normal training area then. Tenjiro began to make his way there, taking his sword out and practicing his forms as he went, making sure to keep to the new adjustments in his breathing style. He'd reached about the halfway point between the village and the training area, was just beginning to feel truly comfortable with the new blade. When the first warning bell from the village rang, pausing, Tenjiro turned back to where he'd come from, eyes wide. So, it was happening tonight then. He grit his teeth, sheathed his sword, and bounded back into the village, more than ready for the upcoming fight. XXX, Takeyo, may have been a little jealous of Nezuko at this point. Like his siblings beforehand, he'd spent the last week fighting demons and catching as much sleep as he could during the day. 
he'd only been able to actually sleep a couple of hours that day and was now leaning on a walking stick to keep him going. Nizuko had Naisen to help. Take yo, didn't. He had one Tomioka Jiyuu, who was completely and utterly unsympathetic to Takeo's pain. He had dressed Takeo's wounds at least, and the boy now wore bandages around his chest and upper back, his side right above his hip and his knee, his knee that he'd likely sprained and had to be very careful with, hence the walking stick. Still, as silent as Tomioka-san was and as tired as Takeo felt, he couldn't help but be grateful for the company, and he couldn't wait to get home and tell his family that he'd passed. He'd been able to use the water breathing forms and make it to the necessary site in seven days. Albeit, he'd been a little late on that last morning, and he barely remembered the two girls who had spoken there at the end as he'd been practically about to fall asleep, but they'd still counted it. He was a demon slayer now. As soon as the test had finished that morning, Tomioka-san had taken him aside and explained that he would be accompanying Takeo back to Yurikodaki sensei's house so as to help them move. They were essentially waiting for Takeo to make it home before they left, which made him feel very warm inside. He begged Tomioka-san for a couple of hours of sleep after that, and thankfully, the man had agreed. Like most of his mornings that week, Takeo had slept until the sun became too warm, but those hours had been more than a little welcome. Then they'd started off home and he hadn't slept since. Now it was late afternoon and Takeo was having a hard time keeping his eyes open. But he didn't want to look weak in front of Tomioka-san either, so he forced himself to put one foot in front of the other and did his best to recover whenever he tripped over a rock or a dip or his own two feet. We should rest. Tomioka-san's voice suddenly broke through the daze he'd sunk into. Takeo blinked as he processed those words and then looked up at his companion. The cool, blue eyes stared hard at him. And how often did people have blue eyes? No, focus on the words. I'm fine, he wanted to say. It came out more along the lines of, MFN. They were passing some rice fields. Maybe he could splash some water on his face or something. Yeah, that sounded like a good idea. He half stumbled to the side of the road and fell to his knees, wincing as he jarred his injured one, and then went to lean down into the water. A hand caught his arm, stopping him. He blinked and followed it up to those blue eyes again. Oh, had he not explained? Right, he should probably do that. He opened his mouth, but Tomioka-san just shook his head. Rest, you have done well to come as far as you have. And suddenly, that didn't seem like such a bad idea. Why had it before? So he just nodded and laid down, right there, on the side of the road. He didn't remember closing his eyes. When Takeo woke, night had fallen. At first, he didn't know where he was or what was going on, but he had something soft and warm under his head, and several lumps under his arm and side, thankfully not the side that was injured. It still wasn't entirely comfortable, though, and his body ached again. But he also felt more clear-headed than he had in a while. Then he registered that night had fallen and he sat up quickly, scanning around him for threats because falling asleep like that had been so stupid. What if a demon came by and... Wait. He blinked at his surroundings. In the fading twilight, he could make out rice fields around him. Not trees or forest or... That movement hadn't helped his back or side or knee or any one of the other hundred small cuts he had. And his brain suddenly realized that. Ouch. He hissed. We should change those bandages. A quiet but firm, tenor voice spoke. Takeo whipped around to see whose leg he'd been laying on. Tomioka-san. Oh. He felt his cheeks flush bright red. T. Tomioka-san. He squeaked and looked away. Um, yeah. Bandages. Right. Would you like me to do it? Takeo's cheeks flushed even brighter in embarrassment and he was instantly thankful for the fading light. He'd been laying on this man's leg. Oh. He'd never live this down. Had he really been that tired? And yet, he knew he couldn't change his bandages on his own. Not well. He really, really didn't want to say yes to the man's question, but he didn't have much of a choice. So he nodded and carefully took off his Hayori, the same one Nai-san and Nezuko-ni had worn to their final selections. It was getting rather worn, but he'd insisted, for luck. Now it had multiple new tears that would need to be patched up, and it was easier to focus on that than his embarrassing situation. Come here, Tomioka-san said, voice lacking any inflection, as usual. Takeo did so, sitting with his back to the water pillar who began to unwrap the bandages. He would put them in a separate bag than the clean supplies and burn them later so no one could come across them, especially demons. It was the common practice, according to Yurikodaki sensei I'm sorry for falling asleep on you, Takeo muttered. Tomioka-san paused, but then kept unwrapping the bandages. I don't mind. Takeo blinked. He didn't. But, why not? He glanced over his shoulder in confusion. Don't move. Hi, the younger boy said, looking straight ahead of him again. The man finished unwrapping Takeo's back, and he shivered, bare skin exposed to the cool, night air. 
This is healing well, Tomioka-san said. Takeo relaxed a little. They still hurt, he said quietly. They will for a couple of days. Takeo slumped a little. Then he winced when he felt something cool on his back. Cool and wet. Ah, uh, the water pillar was washing the wound. If the new Mizunoto had been embarrassed before, he was mortified now. He looked up to Tomioka-san, so stoic and strong. And to have the man see him like this, well, to have anyone but his family see him like this was humiliating. At least it wasn't some unknown woman, but still. He bore it with gritted teeth. I still won't carry you, the pillar stated, repeating the words Takeo remembered from earlier when they'd left the final selection. Tomioka-san had told Takeo that he was a demon slayer now, and it was tradition for them to make their way home on their own. Some people didn't adhere to that, perhaps, but Tomioka-san said he did and he would not coddle Takeo. The young teenager had just nodded and followed him. Takeo didn't so much as sigh. I know, was all he said. He kind of wanted to make it back on his own anyway, to prove that he could. After a couple more minutes of silence when Tomioka-san washed Takeo's other larger wounds, he began to rewrap them. Where did the other pillar go? Takeo asked. The younger one. He's accompanying the Yubayashiki children. Yubayashiki. They are Oyakata-sama's children. Tomioka-san hummed in affirmation. Takeo thought about that. Why wouldn't Tomioka-san go with them too? Weren't they more important than a new Mizunoto? Unless, you still expect one of the Kazuki to come after me, he said quietly. The water pillar paused, but then continued. That is unlikely at this stage, he said firmly. We are simply taking precautions at this point, and I would like to help Sensei and your family move. Takeo relaxed a little. A couple of minutes later, the boy felt Tomioka-san's hand stop fiddling with the bandages. I am finished. Takeo nodded. Thank you, Tomioka-san. He stood and began to put his Hayori back on. Then he picked up his walking stick and faced his companion. I'm ready. The older man nodded once and turned to continue down the road, thankfully slowly enough that Takeo could keep up, but at a much brisker pace than what he remembered them plodding along it before. Almost as if reading his mind, the water pillar spoke up after a couple of minutes. We are making good time. Your brother said it took him almost a week to get back after his final selection. How long do you think it will take us? Takeo asked, feeling a little lighter. Likely two days at this pace. Oh, Takeo tried not to let that dishearten him. It may have taken his brother a week to get back, but it had taken them two days and one night to reach the final selection, and they'd already been walking a day now. He'd really like to get back and see his family. He let himself droop for a moment, but then pushed that thought aside. There was nothing for it, so he nodded and looked forward determinedly. He'd just have to do his best. A couple of minutes later, Tomioka-san spoke again. Takeo got the impression that wasn't usual for the man. I would like to make an offer, he said slowly, sounding unsure for the first time since Takeo had met the man. The boy blinked. An offer, yes, I would like to take you on as a Tsuguko, he finally said in a rush, as if getting the words out. A hey, Tsuguko, Takeo said, his mind going blank. He'd heard the term before. What was it again? I would be training you to take over my duties as pillar when you reach the proper skill level. That may take years, but I would give you personal training sessions and take you on upper skill missions with me. He cleared his throat. It is dangerous, more so than just being a demon slayer. But, you wield your water breaths well and have good instincts. You are also intelligent and I can see potential in you. Takeo had stopped walking and was staring at the man's back, or what he could see of it in the dark. Things like that didn't happen to him. Tenjiro was the oldest and the kindest and had that great sense of smell, and that was before he joined the corps and became a pillar. Nezuko had always been so supportive and firm and as the second oldest, and oldest daughter, people tended to focus on her too. Hanako was the youngest daughter and Rokuta the youngest period. Everyone focused on them, leaving Takeo and Shaidru in the background. He'd never really minded, but being recognized like this, it felt good. Ah really? He asked, a little hoarsely. Tomioka-san turned to him and frowned. I would not have offered if I did not mean it. When Takeo did not answer, the man slumped a little, looking disappointed. I understand if you do not want to, he started. Yes, Takeo yelled. Tomioka-san started. The younger boy paused and cleared his throat. Then he bowed, a little awkwardly with that staff in his hands, but he still bowed. I respectfully accept your generous offer, he said as formally as he could. And he stayed that way until he heard Tomioka-san clear his throat. Then come along. Suguko, I will write to Oyakata-sama as soon as we get to Yurikodaki sensei's place and make it official. Takeo felt like he might burst from excitement as he straightened and nodded emphatically. Hi, sensei. Tomioka-sensei seemed a little taken back, but then he relaxed and nodded. He waited for Takeo to catch up and they continued on their way. 
Almost 20 minutes later, as far as Takeo could tell, a caw sound had them both looking up. The younger slayer blinked. He'd received a crow for completing his mission, but had sent it with a letter home to let his family know he was safe and on his way. As far as he knew, Tomioka Sensei's crow was supposed to follow them and keep an eye out, something about the crow being too old to be expected to travel far so fast when it wasn't an emergency. So was this his crow or someone else's? Was it a core crow at all? That was answered very quickly as the crow came hurtling towards him, cawing frantically. It clutched a missive in its claw. Attack. Attack. It cawed. Takeo felt his breath catch. We've been expecting an attack on the swordsmith village, the water pillar pointed out. Well, okay. But then why was Takeo's crow telling them? He hadn't sent his crow to the swordsmith village. Something was wrong. Not swordsmith. The crow huffed. Beside him, Tomioka sensei stiffened. What? He asked, his voice quiet and deadly. It sent shivers up the younger boy's back and he had to resist stepping away out of sheer self-preservation. The anger wasn't directed at him. Not swordsmith. Yurikodaki. Attack on the water cultivator and his students. Takeo's eyes widened and his heart skipped several beats as he began to realize the situation. Who is attacking? Tomioka asked tersely. The crow landed on a branch, gasped and then blurted out a sentence Takeo would never forget. Two waxing moons. XXX. Tenjiro was. Confused. He'd caught the demons from the town, but they'd been weak and easily defeated. Then he'd gone around the town as quickly as he could, but hadn't found more than another couple of weak demons. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. He was so flustered, he decided he didn't have the time or energy to try and turn more demons to his side. He'd been lucky with those he'd turned so far, but Akatsugi himself had proved that just pumping Tanjiro's blood into another demon's body didn't automatically put them on his side something he didn't like, but had spoken to Oyakata-sama about, something he had to accept. He hated it, but keeping the village safe and finding out what was wrong was the bigger priority here. He finally found Genya and Haimjima-sensei clearing out some small demons of their own. He landed just as the older man finished taking out the last of them. Haimjima-sensei, he said hurriedly, where's Mitsuri? Right here. A familiar voice sounded as the love pillar dropped down behind him and ran forward, sword out. I've found a couple of demons, but no waxing moons. It is the same for us, Haimjima-sensei said, frown on his face. Me too, Tenjiro butt in, hating how his stomach twisted under the ever-present hunger. The stone Hashira turned to Tenjiro, frowning. Did the attack go like this in your memories? The sun pillar shook his head. No, something's wrong. Haimjima sensei looked grim. We must keep fighting and protecting the people here. Well, he wasn't wrong, but they also needed to find out what was going on. Just then, Tenjiro heard a crow and turned just in time to catch said crow as it flew at him. Oh, he's mine, Mitsuri said, hurrying forward and opening the scroll attached to the crow's leg. Then she frowned. I can't read it, it's too dark. I can, Tenjiro said, holding his hand out. At least his demon eyesight was good for something. She handed the missive over and he read it, his face going pale as he did. It's from Yuzui-san. We've been called back. Oyakata Sama's house is under attack. By Muzin himself, being here had been a mistake. The demons must have realized the core knew they were coming, because Muzin had launched his final attack. More than three months early, XXX, Kage's health had gone downhill quickly. His doctors said he had days to live just a week prior, but he was determined to remain alive long enough to see Muzin's end. It wasn't easy. The inability to actually do anything other than lay in his futon was almost as demoralizing as the sickness itself. For a little while after that diagnosis, he'd actually regretted rejecting Kamado's offer of becoming a demon. After all, they could burn it away or outright cure the transformation within a couple of months. But the very idea had felt so wrong. He had the strangest feeling that if he did, it would only make things worse. After all, even if he became a demon, would that lift the curse? He didn't think so. So as much as he'd appreciated the offer and been tempted, he'd still declined and resigned himself to his fate, as much as he hated that thought. After all, he had not done anything to deserve the curse, although he'd realized that long ago, it may be a curse on his family, but he saw it more as incentive than a punishment. Musen's evil needed to be destroyed. Would his family even have acknowledged that without the curse? He didn't think so, and he desperately wished to lift this curse so Kyria didn't have to deal with it. Although, if the boy did have to, if everything went horribly wrong tonight, Kageya wanted to set an example for his son, to face his fate head-on with dignity and honor. His father had been all too bitter about it and Kageya hadn't wanted to end up like that, as much as he'd loved his father. But he wanted his son to have a chance at a true and long life, so he was determined to wait as long as he needed to lure Musen out. It hadn't worked all that well. The monster had come so soon. 
Yet as he heard the steps outside the house, so unlike anyone else currently in his estate, he knew. He was sitting with Amain by his side, as she'd refused to leave, and the children playing in the garden who had also insisted on staying with their parents. It hurt Kagea to know they wouldn't survive the night, but he respected their choices. The core members must be on the other side of the estate, training as they usually did. That was good. It meant they wouldn't get caught in the crossfire, and thus, they might just have a chance to survive. Maybe even to help take the monster down. So he turned to smile at the person he heard stepping through the doorway. Hello, Kibitsuji Musen. He heard a smooth, superior voice answer. Hello, Yubayashiki Kageya. XXX. Again, Shinazugawa practically screeched at Akatsugi, his face healing from where his fellow demon had slashed him. The former waxing third grinned, about to comply, when something twinged on his senses. Frowning, he froze and turned towards the front of the estate, putting a finger up to signal a pause. It was unusual enough that the white-haired man complied without complaint. For now, Akatsugi-san, Rengoku said from where he and Nagiro were also sparring. He could see why his paws would catch their eye. they just started. But still, something's wrong, he said. The others exchanged glances and then looked back at him. Then he realized what he sensed. He breathed out. Nakaim, which meant Musen was. Then the mansion on the other side of the compound exploded. Tameo looked up, recognizing that the barest link she still had with Musen was active. She'd thrown his curse off, but she hadn't been able to get rid of every connection to him. It was just small enough that he hadn't noticed, or if he had, he couldn't do anything about it. She wouldn't have noticed herself had she not been adamant on trying to banish every trace of him from her body. Unfortunately, that was the best she could do. Or fortunately in this case, she supposed. Yushiro, she said quietly as she stood. Yes, ma'am. Dress in the Demon Slayer core outfit as quickly as you can. It's tonight's. He paled. But, Tameo Sama. You, Yushiro, she cut him off firmly. I am sorry to leave you so soon, but this is what will make me happy. It is what I have been fighting and researching and living for for over 300 years. You made my life far happier, and I thank you for it. And I apologize again, but I must do this. She hated seeing that heartbroken look on his face, sort of halfway between stricken, horrified and depressed. Please, live for me, she said quietly. Destroying that man and knowing you are living on. That is what will truly make me happy. So that is my request of you. A single tear dripped down his face, but otherwise he showed no hint of a waver. Hi, Tameo Soma. She gave him her most grateful smile. Thank you, Yashiro. Now quickly, let's go. Hi, Tameo Soma. XXX. Nezuko had finally reached a point where she would say she was comfortable with her new body. More than comfortable, really. Yes, she had to eat a lot to maintain it. But her newfound strength was more than useful in several areas of her life, not to mention her breath style, and abilities had taken a huge leap forward once she'd gained more control of her limbs and core. It was thrilling, part of her thought she could take on the world. But then she'd remember Nai-san and Mitsuri fighting the waxing moons and realize she couldn't stop or coast here. She had to keep working, which was what she had done every day since she'd returned to Mount Sajiri. Between that and checking in on an obviously distraught Hanako as well as packing what belongings they had in the house into carts, her days tended to be very full, but she was also ready to get back out there and restart her missions. She wanted to do her part in taking Musen down, after all. She also took time to speak with Senjuro and encourage him, as well as Shaidru, who had insisted he be taught at least how to swing a sword. To be fair, he was starting at about the same age Hanako had, but it still felt like each one of them had started earlier, and she couldn't help but wonder what kind of effects that had on their minds. Then again, if it gave them a better chance at surviving. She sighed and glanced up at the darkening sky. The sun had already set and she was losing what little light they had left. She really should head back for dinner. It might be a little late because Kasan had been out training today too and had likely only just gotten back herself. Huh? She'd never asked her mother for a spar before. Or, well, not since she'd gotten back in any case. Perhaps she should. She took a few minutes to stretch before beginning her trek back to their home. Tonight would probably be their last night if Takio arrived tomorrow. Then they'd all head to wherever the Demon Slayer Corps had set up for them. She felt a little bad for Yurikodaki Sensei, though. He'd been here long enough that leaving hurt him more than the rest of them, she could tell. But they couldn't take the chance that the demons could search the area and find them. She was positive she hadn't been followed all the way here, but still. Her thought shuddered to a halt when she heard something skitter off to her left. She froze and looked deeply into the dark forest, trying to make out what had made that sound. It seemed awfully big. And then she saw them, two red eyes with no pupil. Even though they seemed to flinch away from her, she knew those weren't human or even animal eyes. She drew her sword and held it in front of her. 
Gotta make this quick. Real quick. Kill the girl and go. Make Musen Sama happy. She heard the voice begin to whisper in the woods and tensed. She couldn't tell where the voice was coming from. She called out to her crow, not taking her eyes off of the woods. Go to Yurikodaki Sensei's and tell him I am under attack. Then inform the swordsman Smith Village or Oyakata Sama, whichever one he tells you to. Ka, the crow said and she heard it fly off. She hated how that made her feel particularly alone against this monster. Then she saw the demon skitter, on all fours, from behind one tree to another. There was just enough light for her to make out his form. And she gasped. That was Waxing Moon 4. She was sure of it from her brother's descriptions. And she was facing him alone. XXX. Sakonji smelled the demons before they showed up. Yes, demons. As in two. And they were waxing moon level. Kai, he said quietly. She looked up from where she'd been making dinner and saw him staring into the distance. Take the children up the mountain. Go. We were too late. She asked, her face paling. Yes. She dropped everything. Grabbed Rokuda and her sword and hurried out of the other side of the house to grab the boys and Hanako. Meanwhile, Sakonji took his own sword up and looked towards the nearest presence. Are you simply going to hide? He called. A chuckle answered him. A familiar chuckle. The demon that appeared almost took his breath away and certainly made him sick. He had familiar yellow and red hair over red, orange and yellow scales coating the sides of his face and all down his hands ending in the sharp claws. He had clawed feet and a long, serpentine tail moving from side to side behind him. It was the eyes that got to Sakonji, though. Familiar shape. Familiar iris color on black sclear and a large smile with fanged teeth. Instead of pupils, the words waxing sick stood out, mocking. Not the eyes themselves, those seemed to have a spark this man had been missing for so long. But like Musin himself was simply flaunting his newest waxing moon. Just to hurt them. Sakonji, like everyone else in the core, Hated Musen. Demons had attacked his family when he was young and he'd been saved by the core. He'd trained and trained and never found the demon who had taken his family from him. Sometimes he didn't know whether that was a blessing or a curse, but he'd made peace with the knowledge that he'd likely never find that demon a long time ago, and had just focused on destroying the demons he had come across. He'd run into his fair share of waning moons, had even taken their heads, but he'd never gone against a waxing moon. They told me you'd be good, the demon said, looking pleased. Rengoku, the former water pillar said, glad his voice sounded as firm and steady as ever. He remembered when this man had become their flame pillar. He remembered encouraging the man, hearing about his engagement and the births of his children. He remembered learning about the man's family, his brothers who had both been killed in the line of duty and his sister who had been killed at far too young of an age as well. It hurt to see him like this. He'd never had to face someone turned into a demon. Not like this. The closest had been watching his student slowly become a demon, and that had hurt. But it had still been his student in the end, the kind, loving and determined child who he'd met that first day. He doubted this would end the same. The demon before him frowned. Who, knowing that he'd lost his memories hurt as well, and it meant they had a fight on their hands. But it would have been so much worse if he'd remembered and still been willing to fight them. My name is Sinahi, he corrected. Fu Sinahi, unholy fire, corrupted fire. Sakonji sincerely doubted the name was a coincidence. He used to be Rengoku Shinjiro, a former flame pillar. He wanted to see the new demon's reaction. He got surprised. Really? You knew me when I was human? Yes. Interesting. Unfortunately, I don't have time to listen as we're on a bit of a time crunch. So, he held up his sword. So be it, Sakonji said, hating the stab of pain he felt at the other's dismissal, and raised his own sword. He would do his duty and protect the Kamados, even if it meant destroying one of his best friends. XXX. Nuakairo didn't know why he remembered certain things and others he just didn't. He remembered his missions, his training, his instincts and routes to take when traveling. He remembered things but not people. And maybe if he did remember, it would bother him more, but he didn't, so it didn't bother him. He suspected it was a rather sinister spiral, but just couldn't bring himself to care. So, you're the newest pillar, the old man at the safe house commented. Nuakairo frowned. Had he met this man before? He didn't think so. He may have actually remembered the old man's missing leg and resulting peg if he had. Yes, he fully expected to remember that leg in the future but not the man. Said man grinned and nodded. Hyuajima Jigoro, lightning cultivator, he introduced. It did good, escorting the twins back here. The mist pillar looked past the old man to see the twin girls calmly enter the safe house they'd been staying at for a couple of weeks now. At least, he thought it was a couple of weeks. Could be months or years for all he could trust his memory. Another man, this one far more familiar with the red mark around his eye, 
hair so light it could be white and large stature, shot him a nod as he held the door open for the girls. Takito Muikairo, Muikairo said, a little tired and a little annoyed. He just wanted to go. I'll take my leave now. Don't you want dinner or something? The man asked, raising an eyebrow. The mist pillar paused. He hadn't had anything to eat for a while now. Had he? Before he could respond, though, a dark-haired boy with a necklace in the shape of a yellow tomo came running from the house. Sensei, there's an attack on the head's estate. He yelped, holding a very tired-looking crow in his hands. Muikairo didn't pause any longer. He turned and began running in the direction of the Yubai Ashiki estate immediately. Taigaku, go with him. Hi, Sensei. Muikairo heard steps on the ground behind him, but didn't care. He turned his focus to the few people he could remember. He would make sure he wasn't too late. A sharp pain shot through his head, and he frowned but then shook it away. Now was not the time. Now he was needed. And this time, he would save the people he loved. XXX. Tomiko woke in the dark. Alone. To massive rumbling and loud noises. She shrieked and covered her head with her hands. All six of them. Only after nothing followed up did she look up and around the small, dark space she was in. What? What had that been? And why had it woken her from sleep? Slowly, she got up and crept down the dark hallway of the cellar-like basement she found herself in. She didn't like it here. It was empty and cold and so dark. Except for the light from down the hallway. She hurried towards it. The warm glow flickered and moved. She didn't understand why until she saw the house above her, or what was left of it, burning away. She peeked her head up, realizing she was in a half-destroyed, stone stairwell, likely why it had stood up to whatever had happened. And she had no idea what had happened, but she could see nothing but fire and debris in the area surrounding the stairwell. She thought back, trying to work out some explanation. The memories came back slowly but steadily. Her past, her brother, her mother, chasing down and eating people for years and years how old was she, really? And why hadn't she cared before? Then the new demon, the kind boy who had given her her memories back. And then she'd gone to sleep. So where was he now? Was he all right? He was a demon and they could live through anything. Right? Even this? And then she saw him out of the corner of her eye. He was nothing more than a skeleton slowly rebuilding itself. She ducked out of sight, but she knew him. She could feel it in her very bones. That was the bad man. The one who had turned her into a monster. Her blood froze, and part of her wanted to run and never look back, or continue to hide in the basement rooms. However, more than a small part of her wanted to do whatever she could to completely obliterate him. The bad man. The very bad man. And somehow, something within her knew what to do, knew that she had to wait for the right time. She didn't know how, but, it felt like the kind boy. Tenjiro. Yes, that was his name, and she was sure of it. She had to wait for the right moment. Something flashed out of the corner of her eye and she got the barest scent of flowers. This was it. She raised a hand to her razor-sharp teeth and nicked her finger on one of her fangs. Then she flung her hand out like she had a hundred times before, willing the blood out of her to shoot through the air, half in control, half on a whim. She wished she had more control of her power right now, but this would have to do. Demon blood art, hundred hand technique. The blood landed on the bad man and her hands grew from it, all different sizes, wrapping around him. What? He yelled, his mouth only half reformed, so it came out as more of a garbled mess. She even made hands grow from where her blood landed on the ground, reaching up and holding him in place, wrapping around him in so many arms. It wasn't enough to hold him for more than a couple of seconds. She didn't know how she knew that, but she did. She hoped it would be enough for. There, a woman became visible, as if she hadn't moved at all but simply appeared. Hands shoved into the bad man's chest up to her elbow. Kamiko gasped. Then she saw more movement as multiple people approached the bad man, coming straight for him. N-A-K-I-M-E. The bad man yelled. The little demon gasped and flinched away, into a pair of arms. What? They'd reached down and just plucked Kamiko from where she'd hidden. She flinched again and flailed. But instead of letting her go, the strong arms encircled her gently but firmly as she saw the ground speed by and then fall away below her. I got you, kid, a low but calm voice said. And when he said that she felt safe, well, safer, she stopped flailing and looked up to see a man with pink hair. He didn't look at her but he wasn't hurting her either. She didn't know why he made her feel safe except that he reminded her of the kind boy. Wait, she suddenly said, realization rushing through her. She turned and scrambled to look over the shoulder of the pink-haired man and thrust her hand out. She could make her hands sharp sometimes. They needed that here. It just took more concentration and it would be her last contribution. Demon blood art, ten sharp hands. More arms grew out of the blood, rigid and sharp as her own nails, sharper even. They pierced through the mess of tangled arms just as the bad man broke through them with a powerful yell, throwing off all of the hands she'd made before. 
He couldn't throw off the new ones though. He'd still break the spiky hands she knew but they needed to hold him in place. She began to feel very tired again and hungry. But thankfully, the person holding her didn't smell good to eat. You did that, kid? The voice asked. She looked up blearily. The man's eyes had turned towards her, strangely colored with kanji written in them. She got the sense he was a sort of senpai, but didn't know exactly what to do with that. Why yeah, she said. He smiled. Impressive. Good job, kid. I'm tired, she muttered. The man said a bad word. It was kind of funny, but even that couldn't seem to wake her up. Fine, sleep. I'll watch over you, he said, sounding exasperated as he continued to leap around. Maybe if she'd been more awake, it would have been fun. Just as he said that, he leaped and a door opened in the air in front of them. The pink-haired man looked at it grimly, but Kamiko wondered what house they'd come to. She didn't remember that being there. The last thing she remembered was looking over the muscled shoulder at the bad man held in place by her hands. He looked far away now. How far had they gone? In her quickly fading mind, she saw a similar image of the man held in place, not by hands, but by sharp, thorny branches colored such a dark red they were almost black. She wondered where that had come from. Then she slumped in the pink-haired man's arms and knew no more. XXX. Takeo and Tomioka-sensei stared at each other for several seconds. Then, to Takeo's surprise and utter embarrassment, the pillar turned around and offered his back to Takeo. I will carry you. The Kamado boy blinked and then looked ahead worriedly. Then he looked down at his knee and his hand went up to the bandages across his chest. He felt his resolve harden. No, sensei, he said. Tomioka-sensei looked back. We do not have time for you to walk. How much faster can you go without me, though? The water pillar frowned and stood to face Takeo. It will not be a significant difference, but it will be a difference. Tomioka-sensei frowned again. I cannot leave you. Please, Takeo said, practically begging. I know you can push yourself faster and you'll be more ready to fight when you get there if you leave me behind. There are waxing moons there. It's my family. You'll be in danger. They're in danger now. Takeo said back, hating how he felt tears come to his eyes. As my Tsuguko, I'm responsible for you, Tomioka-sensei argued. That made Takeo come up short. But, his family, he was willing to put himself in a little danger for his family's sake. Tanjiro and Nezuko and even Kasan did it all the time. As your Tsuguko, please put your faith in me, he finally said. I can't fight waxing moons like this. I'll just be in the way. But I can keep myself safe from bandits and non-Kazuki demons. His tears began to roll down his cheeks harder. Please, Tomioka-sensei, he finally begged, bowing. Please keep my family safe. The water pillar looked concerned. But finally, he shook his head. Let me carry you to the edge of the territory, and then I'll leave you. Takeo bit his lip, but then he nodded in acquiescence, realizing he wouldn't get a better deal than that. Okay, he said and climbed onto his new sensei's back. Then they vanished. Behind them, on the road, a little eye stepped out from under the bushes, as if to verify they'd gone. Then it hurried back into the undergrowth, leaving an empty road behind it. XXX, we have to go, now, Haimjima-san said urgently to the other demon slayers. Tanjiro and Shinazugawa-san nodded. We can't just leave this place unprotected, Mitsuri pointed out worriedly as they all turned to rush back to the village. Someone needs to stay here to protect the people here. She wasn't wrong, and they knew it. Still, no one answered, and no one volunteered. Finally, Haimjima spoke. We should draw straws. Too many of us have ways around that, Tenjiro pointed out worriedly. Mitsuri blinked, because she certainly couldn't. Or, well, she probably could, but it just hadn't occurred to her to cheat. She bit her lip. Should she stay? She hated Muzan, sure, but she didn't have a personal vendetta against him like the others had. But she was also a pillar and wanted to prove how much she could help. And she'd worked so hard for the level of strength she had now. Let's talk to Tekakawahara-san, the love pillar suggested. The other three exchanged glances and nodded. Two minutes later, they'd all basically bombarded the swordsmith leader's room through any window and door that led inside. The short man jumped and shrieked, arm out as if in protection. But then he slumped in relief, hand over his heart. What is wrong? He asked. Have you dispatched the demon? We've been misled. Shinazugawa-san growled, shooting an accusing look at Tanjiro, who didn't seem to notice. Mitsuri felt herself bristle, but didn't say anything just yet. Muzan must have known we'd prepared here. The sun pillar spoke up. He's attacked Oyakata-sama, but we need to keep someone here too. Don't worry about us, Tekakawahara-san said quietly but firmly. Even if it is an effort to draw you away from us, no one left here is essential to running the new swordsmith village. Protecting Oyakata-sama is more important. 
But, Tenjiro started, however the older man cut him off. Go, and thank you all for putting your lives on the line to protect my village. But you need to leave. Take what you need and go now. We will gather what is left of your things and send them to you. The four demon slayers all looked at each other, a silent conversation between all of them. Mitsuri nodded. She hated leaving this man and his people alone, but he wasn't wrong. Protecting the head of the core was more important, as much as she hated to put value on life like that. Tenjiro felt the same, she could tell. Very well, Haimjima-sen said, bowing low. Please take the best precautions you have to protect yourselves. Of course, Tekikawahara-san replied with a nod of his head. Now go. And they did. Mitsuri rushed through the window she'd come through, Tenjiro through the window he'd come through, while Shinazugawa-san followed his sensei through the door. They were on the road within 30 seconds, rushing along. Haimjima-san had even scooped Shinazugawa-san onto his back, much to the boy's embarrassment. They'd not gotten out of sight of the village before another ka made them all pause. Ka, ka, attack, attack. The incoming crow shrieked. Yeah, we can. Shinazugawa-san started, but the crow went on. At Mount Sajiri, Mitsuri's blood ran cold, but she was positive it was nothing compared to Tanjiro. To confirm, she looked over to her friend, seeing his face pale significantly, eyes wide enough to almost fall out of his head. No, he whispered. A likely story. Shinazugawa-san yelled, suddenly angry. How convenient that his family was attacked right now. He, he wanted. He figured it out. Tanjiro whispered to himself, his skin taking on a distinctly green tone, even in the darkness of the night. They were up in the treetops, so the waxing moon gave a little light. This is obviously fake. You just want it. Shinazugawa started, but Tanjiro seemed to have finally reached the end of his patience as he turned to the other boy angrily, tears in his eyes. Have I ever given you a reason, besides my completely involuntary turn into a demon, for you to question my loyalty to the core? Tanjiro yelled. I thought you were starting to understand. I want Musen dead. And he said it with such vehemence, the glow in his eyes growing brighter for just a moment, that everyone who could see it flinched back. He's after my family. Thea. The tears in Tanjiro's eyes began to roll down his cheeks and he heaved a sob, eyes somehow getting wider. Then he put his hands up to either side of his head, a low keening sound coming from his throat. He's making me choose. That monster is making me choose. And then he screamed. Mitsuri put her hands over her ears, as did the other two demon slayers. It was only a couple of seconds, but it felt longer. Much, much longer. When Tanjiro looked up again, the boy Mitsuri had come to think of as a little brother was gone. He had such an expression of anger and hatred on his face it. It terrified her. Shinazugawa-san must have felt the same. Because he ducked down behind his sensei a little, wide eyes fixed on the demon. And he'll regret it? Tenjiro growled. Literally. I'll make him regret it. She believed him. In a way she'd never believed him before. Then he took a deep breath and shook his head slowly. He closed his eyes and took more deep breaths. Then he looked up at them, eyes pleading. I have to go save them, he whispered. I can't. I can't lose them again. I can't. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. He looked so broken there that it almost erased his previous visage of absolute hate from Mitsuri's mind. Almost. Gathering her courage, the love pillar steeled herself and leapt onto his branch, glad it was thick enough, and put a hand on his shoulder. We understand. All of us have family we have either lost or would give anything to never lose. Rescue your family, then come and help us defeat him. Okay. Tanjiro turned his red eyes, in more ways than one, up at her, pleading with her to understand and hoping that he'd heard her correctly. I. He started. She shook her head, though, and put her arms around him, drawing him into a hug despite many of her instincts screaming at her to run away from him. This was Tanjiro. He wouldn't hurt her. She had to believe that. Though, she whispered, use your fastest speed. Save our adorable younger siblings. We'll keep Musen busy in the meanwhile. If they didn't manage to kill him first. For a second, he just froze, staring at her, before he threw his arms around her in return. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mitsuri, he cried. After a couple of seconds, he stepped back and looked over at the other two. Thank you, too, Shinazugawa-san and Haimjima-sensei. Please survive. Please. Then he bowed, turned, and took off in a flash of what looked like lightning and fire. Combined, Mitsuri's eyes grew wide. Oh, he, wow, well, let's go, she finally said, turning to continue on their way towards Oyakata-sama's home. She pushed off, putting all her effort into maintaining the fastest speed she possibly could while keeping steady before propelling herself just a little faster. If she was a little out of breath when she got there, well, she'd deal. Meanwhile, her best wishes went to Tanjiro, and then to those already fighting Musen. Then she prayed to the Kami to help them defeat Musen that night. Finally, her thoughts strayed to Obanai-san. 
Obanai-san who wanted to court her. Obanai-san who made her feel like she had nothing to make up for. Obanai-san who was already at Oyakata-sama's with Rengoku-san if he'd arrived on time. This, this wasn't fair. Not when everything she'd ever wanted was right there. Okay, maybe she did have a personal grudge against Muzan. And he would die tonight. For Tenjiro. For Obanai. For every demon slayer who had died against any demon. He would die. She would do everything in her not inconsiderable power to make that happen. Please, Kyojiro, Tenjiro, Nezuko. Obanai-san, she whispered so only she could hear. Be safe. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. And comment down your opinion on this video. Thanks for stopping by and I'll see you in the next one.